This is a compilation of the videos I did talking about the early 3D Sonic games. If you've never seen those, great. I hope you've got nothing going on for four more hours. If you've seen them all before, well, you'll watch it all again. I know you will, you sick freaks. Back when I first got into Sonic the Hedgehog, I wasn't part of the fanbase. At least, not traditionally. My family had pretty decent internet and a good home computer, so it's not like I couldn't browse the forums. I just didn't really know what a forum was. I didn't spend much time on the internet. My friends and I mostly used it to find cheat codes. It didn't really occur to me until, like, 2009 that there were online communities, and even then, I wasn't the type of person to go participate in those discussions. I was much too shy for that. And since I really couldn't care less about what some random people thought of Sonic the Hedgehog, it was just me and my friends all playing a bunch of Sonic games. We all loved them, so I guess in my head I sort of developed this perspective that early 3D Sonic was great. Everyone loved this period, right? I mean, I was in love with it, everyone around me was in love with it. Sonic seemed pretty popular. <laughs> You can imagine the whiplash I felt when I discovered that there was a sizable portion of people who wanted nothing to do with the games that practically raised me into who I am today. There was always this unconscious desire in me to combat that negativity, to vilify the people who had the audacity to criticize the games that I grew up loving. I was pretty insecure, but I was also pretty young comes with the territory, I suppose. While it was a well-intentioned pushback in some cases, even the well-reasoned detractors of the adventure era were being attacked during this time, and I think that's when I realized there are dark parts in every splinter of this fanbase. People who will always be unhappy. People who despise their perceived opposition, placing them in camps based on the era they grew up in, making assumptions about which games they like, which they don't, drawing battle lines, people who are, frankly, stuck in the past and will never accept a future for Sonic that isn't the one they want. To some extent, that includes me when I was a teenager. Unfortunately, with a fanbase fractured into so many different pieces, even the best of us can't escape partaking in this toxicity. All of this vitriol, I'd argue, started with Sonic Adventure. game that would bring Sonic and Pals into the third dimension. Certainly, there were a litany of spin-offs, shows, and comics to complicate fan opinions, but when it came to the core games, there wasn't much to discuss in terms of drastic change. At the end of the day, from Sonic 1 to Sonic and Knuckles, it was high-speed platforming. Sonic Adventure was a fundamental shift for the franchise, one that would have unforeseen ripple effects into the modern day, one that would create a whole new subsection of fans who would come to love the series for decidedly different reasons than the old guard. As someone who grew up in this era, you can probably count me among this new contingent of fans. Sonic Adventure 2 Battle and Sonic Adventure DX not long behind made me the Sonic fan that I am today. They hold a special, nostalgic place in my heart, but part of me wonders whether I have a tinted view of them as a result. I fervently argue that Sonic should take a direction more akin to these games, but do I truly understand what that means? After all, the classics turned me off for the longest time, but after I gave them a fair shake, met them on their terms, I came to appreciate why people love them. So that is why you're watching maybe the millionth analytical take about Sonic Adventure. Yeah, it's been done to death at this point, I get that, but I feel like I need to do this for myself. Instead of confronting the question, what do you want for Sonic's future, with answers tainted by nostalgic memories, I want to go back and examine how well these titles hold up. I want to find out if they really warrant such a heated debate. I want to find out how much of their current hold on me is nostalgia, and how much of it is genuine respect. I want to find out what it is that I love about Sonic. You're listening to a Sonic Adventure Retrospective. Hmm. 
What is the appeal of Sonic? In my videos on the subject, I came to the same conclusion as most other fans. Sonic is about some mixture of speed, platforming, and exploration. Whether his levels are open or confined, they seem to be a good fit for Sonic's skills when there are multiple pathways to traverse via his unique physics system. Sonic is about creative player expression, and eventually about speedrunning. Obviously this is a truncated explanation of those videos, I'd suggest checking them out if you haven't already. So I guess the question is, how much of that essence did Sonic Team manage to eke out? Why don't we look at Emerald Coast, Sonic's first level, to see just how faithful Sonic Team was to their design philosophy. Firstly, the physics follow the same principle. I'm sure you could nitpick the exact differences, but the fundamentals still apply. Sonic gains speed when moving down slopes, and can jump off of those slopes for more height. In just this first stretch of level, we can either let it whisk us away, following the bungee cord fences on this boardwalk, or we can spin dash jump on this ramp to skip the section entirely. While it isn't exactly the same, where taking advantage of this system would reward you with higher pathways, it is similar. There are still higher and lower paths in essence, but they aren't always layered high and low. Sometimes they'll be on either side of you, sometimes they'll be hidden, and sometimes it'll simply be a straight shot with a few hidden secrets. Emerald Coast is fairly light on non-linear design. Instead, it's about how efficiently you can skip parts of the level, and how proficient you are at finding secrets. If you have a suspicion that there's a secret somewhere, there probably is one, and I love how each of the levels consistently reward that curiosity. It's a fine first level, using Sonic's physics to its advantage, but admittedly light on the pathway selection that made his more open levels of the past so damn fun to blaze through. Red Mountain is perhaps a better example of that non-linear philosophy in action. There are a bevy of different pathway decisions to make. You can light dash in one segment to skip a tedious section where you climb across ladders over lava. There's a section where you have to avoid fire-breathing stone statues, but you can also take a higher path if you notice the flying bad next to your left guarding a set of jump panels. One of my favorite sections is where you get to spin dash up to the top of a hill that's just out of view. You wouldn't even know about the secrets up here, or the shortcut, if you weren't curious enough to experiment. Almost always these paths can be considered shortcuts, but they're different from the ones in Emerald Coast. In Red Mountain, these are still path options you can take, and much like levels of old, these higher paths are quicker and often put up much less resistance. While it's certainly much harder to weave in between these paths like you once could, there were tons of levels in previous games that didn't allow for freeform pathway traversal, so I see these levels as a 3D spiritual successor to those more confined levels, such as Flying Battery. It's remarkable to me how almost all of these levels nail that design philosophy, but use 3D as a new tool to get even more out of it than a 2D plane could. Speed Highway is a brilliant showcase of Sonic's startling, you guessed it, speed. He's always been fast, duh, but in 3D, you get an even more exciting view of the action. Not only can you see every possible path Sonic can take, you can see every obstacle in his way, which was consistently one of the biggest problems with his 2D level design. Sometimes you'd be moving so fast that enemies and hazards would take you off guard. Now that the camera is positioned behind Sonic, you don't often find yourself blindsided. Instead, the badniks are just more aggressive. In Speed Highway, the patrol car badniks barrel over to your location, forcing you to react quickly. Some enemies throw bombs in your path, some try to grab you, and some try to shoot at you. By simply looking around, you can spot secret paths, and even though I've played these levels hundreds of times at this point, I'm still discovering new things about them by observing my surroundings. Did you know that you can jump onto these buildings at the start of Speed Highway, spin dash up the sides, and make it to the top where an extra life box will be waiting for you? In all my years of playing Sonic Adventure, this is something I never thought to try. Better yet, they knew you could get up here if you really wanted to. The At Dawn section is wonderful for this very reason. At first, it might just seem like a simple zigzag run through to the end. But, this is actually where the game comes the closest to emulating that open, non-linear format of the previous games. You can maintain a higher path by running on the side of this building to get on top of it. If you fail, you have to go through the roads in the bottom path. Maintaining the top path requires several well-timed spin dash jumps and a few well-maintained wall runs. 
There's even an exceptionally well-hidden secret path you can execute a precise spin dash jump to access, which spits you out at the end of the level immediately, skipping almost all of it. This is a good level. That's cool. Oh my god, wow! Holy shit! This is a good fucking level. You can stay on top of the buildings, you can keep a bit of a middle ground, or you can run around with the cars. It's just like Green Hill Zone. It's a three-dimensional canvas with Sonic as your brush. Almost every level in this game has at least some of that classic spirit. Sky Deck has multiple pathway selection and a ton of secrets. Lost World and Twinkle Park are a bit more linear, but offer huge skips if you can perfect spin dash jumping off slopes. Twinkle Park in particular can be broken in half if you know what you're doing. Jump off this ramp and then off this ramp, and you're already at the end. Hard to tell if this was intentional, but Sonic Team did program Sonic to interact with the environment in this way, and they even littered other levels with secrets you can only reach with spin dash jumps, so I like to think it was intentional in at least some respects. Hardly matters whether it was intentional, the fact that you can flex your mastery of the mechanics in this way is dazzling. Sonic controls wonderfully in 3D. It's frankly a lot more impressive to me than Super Mario 64. Where that game felt stiff and awkward, Sonic Adventure is loose in the best way. Sonic has the perfect acceleration speed, his turning is smooth as butter in terms of its speed and stick precision, his mid-air control is excellent. It's hard to explain in words, of course, but even when running at ridiculously high speeds, it feels almost effortless to land exactly where you planned. Sometimes he turns a bit sharper than you're expecting, but this is almost never an issue on levels that give you room to breathe. It's hard to imagine them having done anything differently, because as far as I'm concerned, he controls perfectly. Since you have a much better perception of what's in front of you, and can maintain high speeds without fumbling about in the air, the linear sections of these levels are fun in a way they probably wouldn't be in 2D. In two dimensions, it's pretty easy to just hold right and eventually win, which is why there are an assortment of obstacles to ensure the player doesn't mindlessly chew through their levels. Sonic Adventure, meanwhile, can get away with linear sections in Final Egg or Speed Highway because you're expected to steer Sonic in the right direction and make sure he doesn't fall into the abundance of bottomless pits that accompany 3D design. Even though it's a straight path, you could argue the player still has to put a lot of thought into where and when they're jumping, and at what speed. That doesn't mean all of the linear sections are fantastic. Windy Valley in particular is a bit overbearing with this crutch. Where it might still have a lot of secrets to find, it falls back on these linear rails more often than I'd like. A lot of your time spent in this level will be barreling down rails and watching Sonic run through loops, leaf tornadoes, and all other manner of spectacle. It's a shame because I think it's one of the best showcases of how fluid the act transitions have become. You start out on the cliffside of a lush green mountain, a calming, ambient track underlying a brisk jog. Then, out of nowhere, a tornado sweeps through and sucks you into its vortex. In a transitional piece, you have to make your way to the top of the tornado to hopefully escape. It's much more dangerous, attention kept by a more hectic track. Finally, you escape the tornado and are lifted above the clouds, with a triumphant piece highlighting your successful escape. Almost every level has this. Red Mountain goes from its own vibrant cliffside with some upbeat music, before traveling deep underground, where the music takes on more sinister undertones as you contend with the rising magma and other traps. Sky Deck takes you from the underbelly of the egg carrier, to the exterior, and into its heart. You really get the feeling that you're traveling all over the damn thing. Speed Highway might be the most iconic, taking you from the starry skyscrapers, down the side of a building, and into the plaza below at dawn, as it's aptly titled. 
act transitions feel even more impressive in 3D, because they manage to not only capture the sheer size and scope of the area you're exploring, but give those areas a sense of variety so their sometimes lengthy runtimes don't become too obnoxious. It's also a good excuse to let Jun Sonoy and other composers run wild in the studio. Though undeniably a more rock-infused soundtrack than its Genesis predecessors, it is nonetheless abundant in variety. Emerald Coast's intro is simply iconic. It starts out loud, bombastic, it's sending a message until it mellows out into a piece befitting of a beach setting. Red Mountain has that dominant sax and piano for some jazz influence to create a truly groovy track with just a hint of guitar. There's no other words to describe Final Egg other than diabolical. It embraces a techno beat to emphasize Eggman's mechanical home bass and is a true banger if I've ever heard. I don't think there's a single song I dislike. You'd even think that with some of the new lyrical themes they'd easily drop the ball, but Open Your Heart and It Doesn't Matter are some of the most iconic Sonic songs ever written. In my general Spotify playlist, Sonic Adventure alone takes up a significant chunk of the songs because there are absolutely zero songs that I wouldn't listen to on my own time, and that's certainly saying something. Listening to Speed Highway while I go on my runs lets me embrace my inner six-year-old, aiming to one day be like Sonic. <clears throat> I'm sorry, that was cringe. But it's true, Sonic used to be my role model, what of it? In terms of pure spirit, Sonic Adventure's levels embody almost everything that made the previous games great, and in some ways, even surpasses them. While Windy Valley and Lost World are extremely linear in their progression, they still manage to capture the intensity of high-speed platforming when you're ripping through them. You still get to learn their ins and outs while finding secrets along the way. I think people underestimate just how groundbreaking the switch to 3D can really be. Where a linear 2D Sonic game would probably get a bit boring, a linear 3D Sonic game can make efficient use of its space to hide secrets along an otherwise linear path. Sure, there aren't as many options at face value, but dig a little deeper, and you'll find the same satisfaction of looking for extra lives, figuring out where and when you're supposed to jump, and mastering each level. Even the more explicit breaks from tradition, like Casinopolis and Icecap, are still fun in their own ways. I really enjoy pinball, so spending time on both of the pinball tables to gather rings is really fun for me. And even though it isn't really what Sonic is about, I've never been against this kind of experimentation. Plus, if you don't want to bother with the pinball tables, you can intentionally fall into the sewers for a more traditional platforming experience, even if it's fairly brief and simple. Most of Ice Cap is snowboarding, which is not only a welcome break, but a cool bit of spectacle that these games were founded on from the beginning. Sonic levels were about mastery, sure, but you had your fair share of sections that were meant for pure spectacle. Though they might be more blatant, that's how Ice Cap has always felt for me. It's like a playable version of the intro segment to Ice Cap from Sonic 3. Now I could really dive into the nitty gritty here. I don't like these icicles from Ice Cap because they don't really fit with Sonic's speedy design. I think the extra light dash pathways are inherently brought down by how insanely long it takes to activate the light dash. These Knight's Pinball Table flyby animations can take a really long time for how easy they are to accidentally activate. Hundreds of these same nitpicks are pervasive throughout the experience. Pretty much every level has something in it that doesn't feel right. Ice Cap Snowboard snaps onto the ground very unnaturally, making hills a real pain in the ass to navigate. Emerald Hill has this one infamous section where you can fall through the terrain if you don't let the scripting take over, 
Lost World has this boulder that appears to do a hard rubber band if Sonic goes too fast. Skydeck is just a big, huge mess in general for reasons that are obvious to everyone. All the well-known glitches and quirks have been documented at this point. I'm sure everyone has an example they can share. It's unfortunate, because although you can get familiar with this jank and plan around those more problematic sections, they'll never quite go away. Occasionally, you'll just get some dirt thrown into your eye through no fault of your own, and it casts a thin shadow over an otherwise joyous transition to 3D. But hey, if that's really the only problem here, I can get past that. It's an inconvenience, sure, but I can ignore the jank to get to the fun stuff. These levels are so expertly crafted that it's totally worth getting past. It's not often that you see a slam dunk from 2D to 3D, but for Sonic Adventure, I really do think they landed that slam dunk, to the point where these levels, in my opinion, nearly surpass anything in his 2D outings. Nearly. I said nearly. Don't get mad at me. Good thing there's absolutely nothing else to talk about. Man, I can't believe Sonic Team transitioned so well. I mean, even Mario had growing pains. This is remarkable. I feel like this one's gonna need a bit more explaining. After the cancellation of Sonic Extreme, which was supposed to be his first 3D outing on the Sega Saturn, Sonic hadn't had a core game on one of Sega's consoles in four years. Which might not sound like a long time, but by then, Sega had gone an entire console without a Sonic game. Though Sonic & Knuckles was a huge hit, nothing that came before Sonic Adventure was quite enough to continue the series' massive momentum. Various members of Sega felt that they'd be letting fans down if they didn't release a new title soon, and so in ten short months, Sonic Adventure was developed for the Dreamcast. Originally, it was envisioned as an RPG, with a greater emphasis on storytelling. There was also a desire to abandon the art direction of the Saturn era, as it was assumed outdated. On the face of it, the project seemed ready to follow a completely new, ambitious path. Instead of simply making a high-speed platformer in 3D, Sonic Adventure was a story-focused RPG-esque adventure, with platforming as an occasional flavor. Sonic was redesigned to more closely resemble Western cartoon characters who were seen as more mature. Sonic Team visited Cancun, Guatemala, and Peru as their basis to develop a more realistic look, partly motivated by a desire to show off the power of the soon-to-be-released Dreamcast. Like it or not, a focus on graphical power and spectacle was as true to Sonic as any of his other gameplay precepts, so moving to a more realistic set of environments isn't too crazy a leap. However, it is quite a bit to take in for a simple jump to 3D. Voiced cutscenes to tell a longer narrative, realistic environments rather than ones drawn directly from human imagination, an edgier design for Sonic, RPG influences? Already there are way more cooks in this kitchen. Not only was Sonic Team trying to find a way for Sonic to function in 3D, there was also a not-so-secret desire to reinvent him for a modern audience. Everything was new, the art direction had changed, the project was helmed by a new director, Takashi Izuka, the music was to be mostly handled by Jun Sonoi, whose only notable work beforehand was Sonic 3D Blast, Sonic Adventure wasn't just going to be a faithful transition into the third dimension. It was going to be a paradigm shift. It was going to be a high-speed action platformer, while also being a huge, epic story, while also having six playable characters, while also showing off the power of the Dreamcast, while also charting an ambitious new path forward for the franchise. It's no surprise, then, that while the Sonic levels are genuinely fantastic, I haven't even really scratched the surface of this game's content. Not even close. This game has a hub world, for one thing. You don't go from level to level like in the classics, you instead run around Station Square, the Mystic Ruins, and the Egg Carrier to find the level entrances. As odd as it might sound on the surface, this does feel consistent with the world building of the classics, albeit with a realistic spin. Sonic 3 and Knuckles experimented with level transitions to build a more cohesive world, and it added a lot of story context to each of the zones. Sonic Adventure, in keeping with that idea, places each level on a world map. NPCs roam around, their locations and dialogue change with each level or story you complete. You can keep up with this sleaze bag dating two girls at once, you can follow the story of this little girl waiting for her dad who never came home from the Mystic Ruins. You can watch this poor kid's mother give in to her gambling addiction. All of it, I feel, is a means to an end. 
craft an interconnected, fully realized world in three dimensions. It is their attempt at doing what they did in two dimensions without the inherent limitations. Thus, the hub world. What I don't like about this transition is that we get Sonic and Pals matched up with human characters and environments. Look, Sonic Adventure 2 is my favorite game in this series. Full stop. I love it to death. But I'm not going to pretend I enjoy the fact that Sonic and the President of the United States share the same world. Something about Sonic and his friends being the only anthropomorphic talking animals just takes me out of it all. I get that Eggman has always existed, but he's the exception to the rule. He has crazy unrealistic body proportions, is a mad scientist, and seemed like a bit of an anomaly. Sonic Forces, funny enough, is probably the only game in the series where there are other people that looked like Sonic, and I think it's a much better fit. I don't knock Sega's desire to show off the Dreamcast's capabilities, but I think they lost something in that transition. When Mario went to 3D, despite the core gameplay changing structurally, it still felt like Mario should. He ran around in levels that could have come right out of the classics. Sonic Adventure does look good for its time, in everything but the cutscene direction. Okay, whatever you say, you must have your reasons. But I have to wonder what we might have gotten instead, had the team not focused so readily on flaunting the power of a system that would come to be their swan song anyway. Whenever I replay the game, this hub world is always the part that feels the most tacked on. It's trying to create an interconnected world that isn't stylized to fit with Sonic, and is basically a human town with some forests. It doesn't strike me as a particularly exciting place to explore. What you're often doing in these hub worlds is finding the next story event or level, which is never more involved than place this key item into some weird hole. I mean, what is your favorite part of Sonic Adventure? Genuinely. Is it ripping through Speed Highway? Is it listening to Sonic's new theme song? Is it watching Sonic battle a giant monster to the tune of Open Your Heart? Or is it running to Tails Workshop? In many ways, I understand why a hub world was necessary. This game has six playable characters, and each of their stories take place concurrently. Therefore, having a hub world lets each character's story slot in naturally. Chaos flooding Station Square is supposed to be memorable because you've spent the whole game running around and talking to its citizens. It heightens the tension, and I get that. I'm not trying to say Sonic Adventure shouldn't have had a hub world, but I'm also not in love with the idea of such an expansive hub world either. Hub worlds work best for me when they're contained. Super Mario 64 has a ton of levels, and the hub world is all about letting you choose which ones to enter. There are hidden levels, with hidden power-ups, and you're never in the castle for very long. The next level is always just around the corner. Sonic Adventure's hub world has levels to find, but you can only go through them in a set order. It has secrets to find, in the form of character power-ups, which are undeniably cool, but I think its sequel would find a better way to include those secrets without requiring a hub world. Plus, some of the power-ups you find are required for progression, like the light dash, and I don't understand why. They force you to use this slow-charging, awkward-as-fuck tool in the actual levels just so that they can ensure you have it? Part of the fun of these power-ups is that you can revisit levels and find new pathways. Light dash pathways are fun to use, even if the light dash itself isn't. Instead of focusing on fun uses of the power-up like this, I'm fixated on their use in the hub worlds, and how they probably only exist for these hub worlds. To lock you out of Casinopolis or Red Mountain for virtually no reason. Don't even get me started on this jungle, dear lord. If I've ever gotten lost in Sonic Adventure, it's in this damn maze. It's not the fun kind of maze, like a Zelda dungeon where you can pinpoint landmarks and forge a path. This is the annoying kind of maze, where everything looks the same, and some characters, like Knuckles, need to explore all of it to find progression items. I've played this game a lot, and I think it's telling that I still don't fully know where the keys to Lost World are in the jungle. Were hub worlds an inherently bad idea? Obviously not. But if you were to ask me that same question while I'm playing as Knuckles, fiddling around in the Mystic Ruins for minutes on end, maybe I'd answer differently. Another product of this RPG influence is the more involved story. While the classic certainly had a story, it was subtly told. You got a feel for which zones were dotted around Angel Island and how they all linked up through the level transitions. 
you didn't really get the full picture of Knuckles. At first he seemed like Eggman's new lackey, but by the end you can see he was tricked. Simple, yet effective. Sonic Adventure is trying for something a touch more complicated, which again, is not inherently bad. Delving into more of the lore behind the Master Emerald, why Knuckles has been guarding it for so long, and the consequences of events long past is a perfect way to jump off of a story that introduced Knuckles, the Master Emerald, and Angel Island. It's still pretty simple, all things considered. The ancient Echidna tribe sealed Chaos away in fear of his power, and that led to Chaos giving in to his anger and trying to destroy the world. The message is simple, don't fear what you don't understand. Chaos was a malevolent being who was beaten into becoming a god of destruction. No one is inherently evil, and I like that he gets his happy ending after it's all said and done. He's a fitting villain, except that this is only really a satisfying tale when read on a wiki. Six narratives are supposed to not only intersect here, but also be relevant for the final story, which comes to be problematic. Sonic is trying to stop Dr. Eggman. Tails is tagging along, searching for his own sense of worth. Knuckles is looking for pieces of the Master Emerald. Amy is protecting a bird and looking for its friend. Gamma is freeing his brothers from Eggman's captivity. And Big is looking for Froggy. This leads them all to intersect naturally at various points. Not only does this add more depth to the characters on the whole, it adds intrigue when you're playing for the first time. You meet Knuckles and wonder what he's up to. Later, you get to find out all culminating in a final story where the fragmented pieces of Chaos's backstory come together. Admirable approach, and it has its strengths, but it's not perfect. First of all, dear god, Big the Cat. Yeah, I get it, this isn't some brave opinion. Nothing about this is original, but just why? Why is he one of the six stories? Why does to call deem it necessary for him to see visions of the past? Why is he inserted in other people's stories in the most awkward way humanly possible? Let's get this straight. Sonic Adventure is about being nice to other people, trying to better understand the world around you. It's a story of tolerance and acceptance. Sonic is trying to stop an evil genius from destroying the world. Knuckles is looking for the pieces of the Master Emerald, a sacred gem he's tasked with protecting even if he's all but forgotten why. Gamma, realizing Eggman's cruelty, figures that the only way to free his brothers from his control is to kill them and then himself. Big the Cat wants to find his friend Froggy. Every single level is about him finding Froggy. Even his boss fight. Yeah, he has a boss fight. Now why is Big the Cat in the game? According to Izuka, well I don't even fully know. His quote on the subject just makes it sound like it happened on a whim. But amidst all of them, we thought it would be a good idea to have a character who moved at his own pace, sort of nonchalantly, to change the pace of the game a little. And that's how we thought of Big the Cat. And we figured, since Big was a cat, that, if anything, he should go fishing. They were trying to leverage their assets to get the most out of them, since Sonic's campaign would be pretty short. It led to Tails being allowed to fly around the entire stage, Knuckles being allowed to explore for emeralds, that kind of thing. But this line of logic somehow led to fishing and also shooting gameplay because that was desirable for consumers at the time. Hey, at least Gamma's story is good despite it being self-contained. It explores a darker side of Eggman. You know, the guy who is kidnapping animals, putting them into capsules, and murder robots, literally killing Mother Nature? Kinda makes sense that this guy wouldn't treat his robots very kindly. It's a wonderfully self-contained story. Big is just a waste of everyone's time. Even the better stories fall victim to strange plotting. Sonic and Tails lose their Chaos Emeralds not once, not twice, but three times. The first half of Sonic and Tails' story is about finding and losing Chaos Emeralds. Sonic, oddly enough, is probably the worst when it comes to this. He starts off fighting Chaos, makes sense. Then he's saving Tails, makes sense. Then he gets his Chaos Emerald stolen by Eggman, and they have an Emerald Ping Pong match and are decimated by the Egg Carrier. Sonic is then chased around by Amy a bit, loses her in an amusement park, has to then go look for her, which involves speed highway, I guess? Then we're finally on track again, Sonic's going after Dr. Eggman because he kidnapped Amy. Alright, they storm the egg carrier, defeat Chaos, and abandon ship. Time for the final hurrah, right? Nah, Sonic's gonna enter an ancient temple because that shiny ball of light is shiny, I guess? 
after a fun vision of the past which Sonic barely acknowledges, then it's time to dunk on Eggman. It's a bit... aimless. Ultimately, it's a story of Sonic versus Eggman, but maybe 40% of that story isn't even about Sonic or Eggman. Like, I don't know. I enjoy Amy chasing around Sonic in her story, since it's about her transition from an obsessed fangirl into a burgeoning independent. She starts by running away from an Eggman robot and ends by destroying it. It makes sense that she'd be all over Sonic in the beginning and it fits her character. She's in love with him. But when it happens in Sonic's story, it feels like a needless distraction. Then again, sometimes it fits really well in another character's story. Part of the reason Gamma even has a change of heart to begin with is because of Amy's ability to see his kind nature, and that comes across as a good character moment in her story as well. While admirable, the attempt to make six different stories that all occur and intersect at various points has way more downsides than it has upsides for me. I already explained that there's a neat sense of intrigue when you see another character in Sonic's story for the first time, but do you know what that also means? Sonic and Tails fight Knuckles in their story, so Tails also has to fight Knuckles, and Knuckles has to fight Sonic. And do you know who they all fight? Chaos 4. Oh, you asshole. <clears throat> you can start to see where the problems come in, perhaps. It isn't just that, though. It also means that characters don't have the freedom to explore their own development. As previously mentioned, Amy chasing Sonic feels necessary for her character arc, but Sonic being chased by Amy is not a necessary part of his. In order to make Knuckles fight Sonic and Tails, he has to be tricked by Eggman in his own story, which makes no sense at all. After Sonic 3 and Knuckles, why would he ever trust Eggman again? But he has to meet Sonic so that he can make him lose the Chaos Emeralds so that Eggman can steal them. Maybe I'm weird, but it feels really intrusive. Having each of the stories intersect can drag each of them down by proxy. Add that onto a nothing hub world you're forced to go through every single story, and you've got yourself an ambitious, repetitive mess with some shining moments. And this need to add longevity, to make the most out of the stages they created, would just end up forming a bunch of gameplay styles that struggle to stand on their own when compared to the brilliance of Sonic. I'm gonna say this once, and only once. You know Big the Cat sucks. I know Big the Cat sucks. You know why Big the Cat sucks. I know why Big the Cat sucks. Let's not waste script time on something that a million and one people have already explained. The classics were pretty gradual about adding multiple playable characters. Originally it was just Sonic, then they added Tails, and then they added Knuckles. In terms of control, they were all more or less copies of Sonic mechanically, but with their own additions to make them stand out. Knuckles couldn't jump as high, but he could glide and climb up walls. He was also given an exclusive-ish story, and given his own unique areas in each level. Ultimately though, all three of them were treated as their own playthroughs of the same game, Sonic and Tails especially. Sonic Adventure handles this in a similar way. Though each character might go through the same levels in a different order, they're still basically the same levels give or take a few. Yet, because of the shift to 3D, the gulf between these characters has risen dramatically, and so crafting levels for Sonic does not necessarily translate well to the other characters. Tails being able to fly in Sonic 3 was admittedly a bit of a crutch. There's a reason he's considered easy mode. You can kinda tell that the zones were mostly built for Sonic, even though there were secret paths Tails could take advantage of. It worked because Tails couldn't use things like the Insta Shield or Elemental Shields, and his flight was intentionally slow and a little clunky. It felt like a mechanic that allowed the player more freedom to explore, but it was also a failsafe in case the player fell off a pathway and wanted to slowly make their way back up. Sonic Adventure also sees Tails flying through stages designed mostly for Sonic, but this time there are extremely unfortunate consequences. I mentioned before that Sonic's levels are not exactly the same as they used to be. On the whole, they're a bit more linear, and by virtue of them being in 3D, are far less enclosed. Sonic works beautifully in them, and Tails absolutely does not. For as good as Tails was in the classics, even the most open levels had obstructions that he could not fly through. Walls or ceilings to prevent the player from exuding a cheesy aura. 
Sonic Adventure had to make its paths a little more freeform, and a little less vertical, leading to situations where Tails can break level design. On the one hand, Tails is really fluid to control in the air. He gets up to top speed quickly, can turn on a dime while in the air, and has a fairly forgiving descent. You can also hold a button to descend more quickly, giving you more control of how long you want to be in the air. Unfortunately, this also means that levels like Windy Valley might as well not even exist, because you can fly off the edge of the guardrails, hold the descent button, and watch Sonic desperately rubber band his way back. To call these levels a race is kind of a joke. Casinopolis, fly through the ventilation shafts and ending spike segment. Skydeck, most of the level has no fucking floor, of course you're gonna win. Even in the sections where you can't fly, it's just something from Sonic's campaign. Ice Cap is snowboarding. Again, you have to beat Sonic, sure, but has anyone really lost this race? Ever? Sand Hill is a fun distraction, but to call it a level would be a bit of a stretch. And even the game agrees with me there, since it's labeled a sub-game. Gotta wonder how the idea for Tails gameplay ended up as Racing Sonic? Sure, it's a story about Tails trying to measure up to his best friend, and rise above his inferiority complex. In that sense, a gameplay style that revolves around racing that perceived embodiment of speed is genius. But in terms of continuing the spirit of the previous games mechanically, Tails was always the slow, methodical, explorative playstyle. If I chose Tails, it was because I wanted to spend a bunch of time exploring. Adventure's take on Tails is oddly the opposite. The only level that people consistently agree is the highlight of his campaign is Speed Highway. And I've gotta be honest here, I don't understand why. Like yeah, it's the only level that's actually built for Tails. It's technically a level Sonic went through, but it's a completely different section of that level. However, what you're doing here is ultimately the same as always. Fly forward, go through some automated rings, land on some platforms until you hit the goal. Eggman is nowhere near fast enough to ever be a threat, and the platforms are big enough to make landing on them nothing more than a formality. I do not understand what makes this level fun, I really don't. Here's the thing. I fundamentally believe that Tails cannot work in 3D, and neither can Knuckles. Why? Because they completely go against the core tenets of a 3D platformer. Yes, they found a way to make it work in 2D, but in 3D, where the sky's the limit, good luck restricting a character that can actually fly in levels where the developers have assumed that you'll only be able to run and jump. Can you even imagine the way Tails would work if he had his own levels? His flight would need to be either nerfed substantially, or the levels would have to be huge to accommodate him, and I don't think linear platforming would best suit his abilities. I can't even think of a way to make his flight interesting from a platforming perspective, because you have so much control over what he does in the air. You could make the gaps between platforms bigger, but what does that actually accomplish? It's like extending the length of a normal jump and giving players unbounded mid-air control during that jump. It isn't like Crash Bandicoot making short hops to small platforms, where most of the challenge comes in how little time you have to make sure he's landing where you want him to. It's just directing Tails where he needs to go before he starts his descent. I cannot see the fun in that. This is why I'm so glad they turned Knuckles into a treasure hunter. Genuinely. Knuckles can glide and climb up walls, which isn't as broken, but still kind of powerful. I can't imagine making 3D levels work very well for him either, there are just too many questions. Instead, Sonic Team asked themselves how to best create levels for him that made sense for his controls, and what we got are sandboxes where you explore for emerald shards. They take place in many of the same levels, but are often recontextualized, since Knuckles isn't gunning for the capsule at the end. Certain parts of Skydeck and Lost World are a perfect fit for Knuckles' abilities, and making him search around the level is a genius way to get more mileage out of them. Now, I won't say it's a perfect gameplay style, it still doesn't hold a candle to Sonic. It's a little too easy, since your radar is quite a liberal tool, and to call can be used at any point to simply tell you where the emeralds are. The levels also don't get very big, which means the radar is even more broken than it otherwise would be. When you're searching such a small area and your radar is beeping for all three emeralds at once, the levels kinda fly by like nothing. Red Mountain is probably the best level for Knuckles, precisely because it's the biggest one in the game, and you need to check everywhere to find the emeralds. Speed Highway is a close second, since you have to explore the entire city, though it loses the sheer height that Red Mountain had to its advantage. This is when Knuckles' gameplay is functioning at its best, and I just wish he had more levels to work with, or at least had more levels that were specifically built for him. 
I love that you get to explore more of this casino, but it's just too small to be all that enjoyable. Skydeck feels like a big chore since you have to first figure out where the emerald is, determine if it's inside a door, and then go change the elevation of the ship if it is behind a door. Gravity controls, by the way, aren't placed in the center of the level, they're shoved off at one end of it, which leads to a ton of back and forth. There's a little too much busy work involved for my liking. He certainly isn't perfect, but I bring him up as a point of contrast with Tails. Tails was a character who they faithfully translated from 2D to 3D, and he is miserably boring, whereas Knuckles is a character they had to change pretty substantially from 2D to 3D, and he's got a really solid core foundation. I use this to illustrate for perhaps the 50th time in my YouTube career that the jump from 2D to 3D is extremely complicated and sometimes calls for drastic change. In this case, it may have even needed some drastic change. I'm not saying anyone has to like that Knuckles is now a treasure hunter, just as I'm not saying anyone needs to like that Mario invented a whole new subgenre in his first 3D game. I'm just saying that there was at least a reason for it to happen that makes sense. A 2D Tales does not a 3D Tales make, and Sonic Adventure is the perfect case study for that. In keeping with tradition, this game takes on a few new playable characters. Amy is a slow burn, where you run away from zero and do some very light puzzle solving. And I do mean light puzzle solving. Are you ready to match up colored blocks and play guess which one of these doors is the correct one? Be careful, it's truly random, so you have to go through this obnoxious guessing game whenever you replay this level. On the one hand, nothing about Amy feels terrible. I love building up speed and using her hammer jump. I think trying to get away from Zero is a decent way to give her levels more tension. I like her hammer, since it allows her to not only fend off Zero, but deal with any enemy blocking her path without stopping her momentum. Sonic's homing attack, while a necessary change to make attacking enemies feasible in a 3D space, does still stop your forward momentum in a way that is kinda pace-breaking. I like that Amy's attacks, at least when she's airborne, don't stop her momentum. It's just that her levels aren't anything special, and she only has three of them. It is true that Hot Shelter may as well be a new level, since Gamma is the only other character that really plays through it. I would argue it's probably her best level, but I don't think that's saying much. More than anything, these levels expose just how unobtrusive and useless Zero feels as a mechanic. Sure, he's almost always chasing you, but what can he really do to you? His super long charge-up shot? Amy can get in there and bonk him. After which, you're given ample time to run away. Putting the colored blocks into the right holes is the only time he has a presence. You have to keep stunning him to complete the puzzle. Outside of that, though, he's just a slight nuisance. Like a housefly buzzing around your ear on a hot summer day. Having him be the final boss is great for her story. She spent the entire game running away from Zero, and so at the end, she's gonna show how powerful she truly is and stand on her own. This story is half the reason I even like Amy as a character but that doesn't come across as well in what you're playing. Amy feels capable from the get-go. It never really feels like she's actually in any danger, so fighting Zero at the end is just a given. Of course you're gonna clown on him, he only captures you in a cutscene. It's also such a short story that it borders on being irrelevant. This is a problem with all the characters who aren't named Sonic. Tails and Knuckles do feel like complete stories with enough girth to make them worthwhile characters. Amy and Gamma, on the other hand, while fun in their own right, with great stories to tell, are criminally short. Gamma's story is excellent. A robot who turns on his master, frees his brothers by killing them, and then dies. It's a simple story. Gamma is inspired by Amy, as well as witnessing the evil of Dr. Eggman firsthand, to defy the Doctor's orders and destroy his creations. I wholeheartedly love everything about his story, but it's also a brisk set of events. He has five levels, but two of them probably shouldn't count. The first level acts more as a 20 second tutorial. It's a mix between platforming and shooting with Gamma. You hold down the fire button, let him lock onto targets, and let go to watch the fireworks. Higher lock-on chains will award him extra time, since his levels count down rather than up. Neat sentiment, but the timer doesn't really mean much of anything until Hot Shelter, where, let's be honest, it still doesn't mean much of anything. His levels might be a bit too easy, but there's a simple pleasure in trying to rack up as much time as possible with ludicrously high chains. The longer you store the numbers, the more chance you'll get hit and stopped dead in your tracks. You also can't hold the button down for too long, or it'll turn blue and deactivate. 
which forces you to pick and choose the best times to release the button. It is such a shame that Hot Shelter is the only level where the fun of this system is put on full display. You ride on moving trains, dealing with the enemies as they sidle up next to you. It uses your hover ability to great effect for mid-air chaining and secret areas, and it has the length of a real level despite the timer still being a non-issue. Emerald Coast is as short as the tutorial level. There's almost nothing of value to even do in it besides run to the end. Windy Valley is a little better, but only a small portion of it, as is Red Mountain. At least those two levels test a bit of your platforming, as short as they may be. His story has a lot of impact for sure, but it's hard for me to deny how abrupt it feels. I wouldn't say the story itself is paced badly, I just feel like the levels lack the substance to give his story more staying power. This game's message is seemingly that Sonic gets all the attention, and the rest of the stories merely get his table scraps. Only some of Sonic's levels, and only some portions of those levels, using gameplay styles that, while sometimes fun, are completely eclipsed by Sonic in an almost comical way. Knuckles and Gamma are my two favorite gameplay styles besides Sonic, and they aren't anywhere near their full potential, mostly due to a lack of stages they can truly call their own. It almost makes them feel irrelevant, especially during the last story segment. <laughs> See, I think the single greatest sin of Sonic Adventure is that it absolutely does not earn its last story. In a vacuum, when you understand the whole context and can read summaries of it, Chaos's story is compelling. But the way it's told in-game is another story entirely. You're told bite-sized chunks of it in each story, in ways that I've already mentioned don't really fit at all for any of the characters. Takal will show each of them visions, they'll barely even comment on what happened, and then they'll be back to whatever they were doing before, as if these visions didn't affect them in the slightest. According to our characters, they might as well have never even happened, which is particularly odd when it comes to Knuckles the Echidna, who guards the Master Emerald and is an Echidna, did I mention? Here is his reaction to learning more about his heritage and purpose. Is this a dream? It's more like a nightmare. Mm hmm, great use of a line there. So let's get this straight. The characters don't give a fuck about what's happening in these flashbacks, not even Knuckles, the character who should be very concerned about them. They're shoehorned into the various playthroughs with no time for contemplation, and the events are told out of chronological order, leading to frankly unnecessary confusion. I love Pulp Fiction as much as the next guy, but telling these events out of order doesn't seem to have much of a purpose. I do sympathize, since players are technically allowed to do the stories in any order they want once they finish Sonic. Plus, the stories already don't line up sequentially, so in that sense, it fits. But I feel like, in the case of the character stories, you get neat little alternate viewpoints on previous events. Tails thinks of himself a little more highly in some of the encounters with Dr. Eggman. Knuckles can be viewed slightly more sympathetically now that you know the full context of his story. And Gamma especially benefits from this additional context, as his first appearance happened when he was still subservient to Eggman. For the flashbacks, though, it just serves to make everything disconnected and needlessly confusing. When I get into the last story, it doesn't feel as earned as it really should. Other characters serve no gameplay function, it's just Sonic. They bring him the Chaos Emeralds, I guess, but let's be real here. Some of them just didn't need to be there, and really should not have been here because they don't have any reason to. Why? In concept, this supersonic final boss is epic, and in many ways it works in execution. Open Your Heart is blaring in the background, playing as supersonic feels wonderful, and Perfect Chaos is intimidating. He destroyed all of Station Square, an area you'd become very familiar with. That's a pretty impressive feat for a villain. He's also free of the constraints of Eggman, so he can do whatever he wants, which at this moment is fueled by anger and a longing for revenge. Being forced to play as all the other characters to unlock this story, though, doesn't really add much to this story, because it's really all about Sonic. The other stories are fun and meaningful in a vacuum. They just don't all come together like a last story implies they would. Was it really worth revealing his backstory before the last story? Maybe you could have had a last story where the flashbacks are the point of focus. Instead of having them play out at completely disconnected parts of the character stories where they're forced to not acknowledge anything happening for fear of getting in the way of the plot, 
Having the flashbacks happen in the last story would not only give each of the characters something to do, but it would make the reveal of perfect chaos all the more satisfying. You could still have hints in each of the characters' stories, but those would be more subtle and wouldn't intrude on each of the characters' journeys. Maybe one last hurrah for Gamma, especially from Amy, to make him feel like he played a part in these events at all? I don't know, maybe that's a pie-in-the-sky dream to have had back in the 90s, but I can't help but feel like Sonic Adventure loses far more than it gains by having six playable characters and trying half-heartedly to have them all connect by the end. Everything about the way the plot is structured and how much time is divided between each of the characters feels messy. It's an amalgamation of reused levels, assets, and original stories with some filler thrown in for good measure. It kind of left me a bit... sour. It's a bit surreal to have arrived at that conclusion. I used to sing the lyrics of Open Your Heart while I battled Perfect Chaos as a kid. I loved messing around in the hub worlds, I honestly even loved vibing out as Big the Cat to this unreal banger. And nowadays, I honestly couldn't care less about anything other than Sonic himself. Tails and Amy are so boring I could cry, Knuckles and Gamma are better, but have almost nothing to call their own, and end before they ever really get going. Yet, I've played this game something like 30 times over the years. Some nights I'll just boot up Sonic's story and beat it in three hours, after which I'll put the game down and start again a few months later. In one sense, this sense, Sonic Adventure is one of the greatest games I've ever played. It's a fast-paced, three-hour romp through some of the best 3D platforming levels I've ever seen. It's not without its problems, but fuck if I care, it's a goddamn blast. In another sense, though, Sonic Adventure is a boring mess. An incoherent plot structure desperately trying to weave together six different storylines, a set of characters who live in the deepest recesses of Sonic's tall shadow. If you were to ask me what I thought of Sonic Adventure, I'd have to first ask you which Sonic Adventure. The one I play every single year without fail? Or the one I haven't touched since I was a child and probably won't touch for years to come? If you can't see where or why this fanbase started to splinter, frankly, you're blind. Sonic Adventure is a game you can't fit neatly into a box. You can't cleanly recommend it to someone, nor can you easily explain why you gravitate toward it. It has an unspoken energy in its speed stages, that the series would have a very hard time replicating. Though it is ultimately a minuscule amount of the game's content, it's the only content that really matters to me. Yet, talking about Sonic Adventure will always necessitate a discussion of the weaker links, the dead weight. I could be disingenuous, ending this video by saying part of this game is really good and the rest sucks, the end. But that isn't really the end of the story. I still play this game a lot, it might only be a slice of a larger whole, but I vibe with that slice. I want it to have my children. Can I really say in good conscience that I'm down on the game nowadays because a part of it that the game never even requires me to interact with is mediocre? There must be something to be said about how many damn times I've replayed Sonic's campaign. It can't just be swept under the rug as a fluke in what was otherwise a failure. It doesn't sit right with me. I love Sonic Adventure. Even if it isn't what we colloquially know as Sonic Adventure, I love my Sonic Adventure. And I don't think that fire will ever fade. Sonic Adventure 2 is my favorite Sonic game, and one of my favorite games ever made. Sonic Adventure 2, in particular, was probably the first game I ever fell in love with. I try my best to be honest in these videos, to lay my heart out on the table and let you look at it. Maybe even poke at it, just don't sever any of my arteries. I wanted to assure you that although this game holds a special place in my heart, it has only remained there so readily because of its inherent quality. Not every game I'm nostalgic for maintains that same stature. Wind Waker still has a really special place in my heart. It was my first Zelda game, I have so many memories with it, and I will always love it. But I don't come back to it much, since I find it to be one of the weakest games in the series, even if I do still enjoy it. In this case, my feelings have only ever gotten stronger. I've played Sonic Adventure 2 hundreds of times throughout the years, and as of recently I've been learning the speedrun for it. 
I've become intimately familiar with its many flaws and still can't help but love it to death. Where I only really love Sonic Adventure in part, I love Sonic Adventure 2 full stop. It is one of the best sequels I have ever seen. It doesn't really harken back to the classics in any meaningful way. Instead, it carves its own path. In a lot of ways, it's a bold new step. A step that would inevitably change the series forever. I want to talk about that. The ways in which Sonic Adventure 2 improves upon the original. The staggering ways in which it pushes the series to new and interesting heights. You're listening to a Sonic Adventure 2 retrospective. Sigma Alpha 2 heading due south over the city. We're en route. Everything's a go. This is Control Tower. We have you on radar. Report cargo status of captured hedgehog aboard. Over. That's a 10-4. Cargo secured on board and... What? The Didn't hedgehog copy that. Over. is gone. He's taken out everyone aboard and... What's wrong? What in the Come world? In. Over. Freeze. What do you think you're doing? My three favorite gameplay styles from the original were as follows. Sonic, Knuckles, and Gamma. Sonic was absolutely incredible, whereas Knuckles and Gamma had a ton of room to grow. Knuckles and Gamma's gameplay styles have transitioned beautifully into the sequel, with entirely new levels that take advantage of their strengths. Sonic, on the other hand, didn't have much room to grow, and in fact, I'd say his and Shadow's levels took a step not necessarily backward, but in a different direction. Most of his SA1 levels were an exceptional transition from his classic outings. There were speedy moments, platforming bits, and slower explorative segments. SA2 is built in a similar way, but ratchets up the linearity a bit to offer a much more speedy style of play. City Escape is fairly straightforward. There's one path to the end, with a few secrets off to the side. It's a lot more confined than Emerald Coast. There aren't nearly as many secrets, and pathway options might as well be non-existent. Instead, the level focuses on maintaining your momentum. Nailing tricks on the ramps, swinging off the poles, jumping from rail to rail, keeping your balance along the way, and even outrunning a giant truck. I do still appreciate that there are secrets to find here, but whenever I replay the level, I'm focused on the tighter path, trying to improve the rhythmic flow of speedy platforming the level encourages. It isn't to say that pathway selection is completely absent. Green Forest has a few short split paths, as does Radical Highway and Final Rush. Radical Highway's bridge segment is the most blatant vertical pathway selection the series has seen in 3D yet. Either you fall to the bottom and slowly float your way through, maintain the middle path with some pole jumps, enemies, and platforms, or grind up the railing for a swift bypass of the section entirely through the top. If you're good enough, you can even jump in between these loops to immediately reach the top. Even here, though, platforming skill and reaction timing are essential if you want to keep up your combo streak of flashy maneuvers. SA1 certainly had moments where you could fall from grace. In Speed Highway, there were wall-running segments that saw failure barring the player from accessing higher, faster pathways. It wasn't necessarily a priority, though. Most shortcuts were achieved using spin dash jumps. SA2 has a lot more do-or-die moments jumping from these rails onto the pumpkins in Sky Rail, making it to the top of the rocket in Metal Harbor, making it to the highest bumper in Green Forest, jumping with the right timing in Final Rush on these railways, and nailing the many, many trick jumps that exist in every speed stage. Chiefly, these pathways aren't necessarily about extra life boxes or interesting alternate pathways, they're often about faster pathways that bypass some of the slower, more mundane platforming. Sonic Adventure 1 was more freeform, allowing for a lot more creative player expression. It was about where the player wanted to go and at what speed they wanted to do it. Sonic Adventure 2 is more about the execution of difficult tricks to maintain your rhythmic pace throughout a set of fairly linear courses. There's a significant distinction between these two styles of speed, and I can't say which I prefer over the other. One has more of a brisk pace to it, a relaxing jog through levels begging to be explored. Another is a demanding set of levels which require precise timing, with the reward being that you'll feel like a speed demon when you reach the end. 
At the very least, I consider them both to be the peak of Sonic's gameplay, since their control schemes and general level design are similar enough that it's hard to notice the more subtle tweaks to the level design philosophy. What I will say is that this is certainly a consistent design philosophy. With the exception of Final Chase, which is stricken by a sickness similar to Skydeck, every level is built for speed. Sonic Adventure had levels like Windy Valley, which were far too linear and didn't reflect the game's core design at all. It was pretty boring. From City Escape to Final Chase, every level is built to take advantage of their speed, so on that front I'd call it a success. To say they're flawless, though, would be overstepping my bounds. Pyramid Cave is pretty cool, built around timed hourglass switches, but when you get around the midpoint of the level, all of a sudden you have to retrieve an object to open a door. It's a major pace breaker and doesn't mesh well with the winding downhill turbines and slowly closing doors. Final Chase would be a fun stage if the gravity tubes weren't so awkward. Shadow trips every five seconds, often halting his speed. I find it the most cumbersome when traveling on the vertical tubes. Horizontally, I think it's a fun challenge, avoiding enemies and obstacles while maintaining your speed. Compared to Final Rush, though, it's a lukewarm way to send out the dark story. Generally, they are fun to master. Where the speed gameplay is different, the mech and treasure hunting gameplay have made significant strides. Gamma was built around beating the timer, racking up lock-on combos to add time. SA2 has repurposed the lock-on combo for something we'll talk about later. It is extremely refreshing to have levels built from the ground up for Tails and Eggman. Prison Lane is a good showcase of what to expect from these levels. Lots of enemies, some of them making a beeline for you, and a ton of opportunities for lock-on chains. These levels are about chaining efficiency. The faster you clear out the enemies, the quicker you'll be able to progress. Usually I hate when Sonic games do this, forcing you to defeat enemies to open up a door. Heroes and Rush are particularly guilty of it, but I think it's fine in SA2 since all the enemies die in one hit anyway. Plus, some enemies need to be juked around, like the Artificial Chaos, meaning you can't just hold the button down and expect a win. In fact, Eternal Engine has an even better remedy for spamming the shoot button. Dynamite packs are placed on airlocks, so you could get sucked out into space if you aren't careful with your trigger finger. It does the same thing with platforms later on. You really need to pay attention to what you're locked onto when you shoot, which is much more manageable in this game due to the changes made to the mech controls. Gamma had to turn his entire body to target enemies, which worked for his wider level design. Tails and Eggman can't turn as sharply or they'll lose all their speed. To accommodate for that, their top halves will swivel faster than their lower halves, giving you the freedom to choose your lock-ons without turning the whole mech. This is particularly useful when trying to maintain speed while quickly dealing with the obstacles in your way. You can still charge forward without completely pivoting the direction you're running. Admittedly, I'm torn on this change. While it's easy to maintain speed barreling down a hallway, it's a lot harder when the camera pivots a 90 degree angle. You'll often find yourself pushing the stick a little too far and losing all momentum. Gamma's a lot more free in this sense. The swivel does make locking onto enemies more simple, and if I wanted to be pretentious about it, I'd even say that the way Tails and Eggman control their mech suits is probably how it would feel to operate an actual mech suit. At this point, I'm just happy there are actual fun levels to play around in that are built around these more restrictive controls. Weapons Bed is fast, requiring that the player avoid colliding with enemies while hovering. It's a straightforward stage, nonetheless pretty fun. Sand Ocean is a platforming stage, since you're there before you get the hover ability. Platforming with the more limited movement can be trickier than you'd think. However, it's also a level that exposes a bit of an annoying tendency in almost all of the mech stages forced wait time. Whether you're waiting for a pillar to fall, platforms to move, cylinders to raise, or these insufferable elevators. Fun as these stages can be, there is an alarming amount of waiting the player has to do before they can return to high octane running and gunning. I have fun in Cosmic Wall when I'm hover flying and getting rid of the pesky artificial chaos before they boot me into the space below. I don't have fun in Cosmic Wall when I'm placed onto a moving platform and forced to waffle about for a solid minute. Thank god the speedrun can skip these segments. Hidden Base presents a really good compromise. There are doors that can only be broken by a few shots. Same with the dynamite packs you can shoot to lower platforms. You can usually snipe these from far away if you're good enough, 
thus eliminating the potential wait time. Even if you are waiting behind a door or dynamite pack, you'll only be waiting for a few seconds, and those few seconds will be filled with the player rapidly removing said obstacle. Hidden Base is one of my favorite mech levels for that very reason. Almost nothing in this level forces you to wait around. It's all about how fast you can clear out your surroundings, the core of the mech gameplay, as far as I'm concerned. It's a shame that levels like Iron Gate, Prison Lane, Lost Colony, Cosmic Wall, Sand Ocean, and even Cannon's Core have forced waiting in them, but at least they don't encompass the entire level. Which brings us to Treasure Hunting. In my opinion, this has had the most substantial upgrade. In SA1, Knuckles had a lot of potential, but most of his levels sucked. Red Mountain was probably the best fit for him because of its verticality, and how easy it was to get Knuckles where he needed to go. Even then, though, to call as a hint system was just broken. She'd tell you where to go, you didn't even have to think most of the time. Casinopolis, Speed Highway, and Lost World were just too small for their own good. You can tell they were specifically built for Sonic, and Knuckles was simply inserted into them. His campaign is a flash in the pan, and not a super bright flash. There was a lot of room to grow. I think it's important to acknowledge just how influential space is for the treasure hunting levels. Big levels almost always equates to a more challenging, rewarding hunt. Wild Canyon and Dry Lagoon are great showcases of that. They're the least exciting by virtue of their smaller size. You don't have to cover as much ground, so finding the emeralds is a simple endeavor. Compare that to Meteor Herd and Mad Space. There is a lot to explore in these levels. They're extremely vertical, but also fairly wide. You'll have to be very thorough in your search to find where the shards are hiding, so you spend a lot more time building a familiarity with the map. Pumpkin Hill is an even better realization of what Red Mountain was. A wide open space, very vertical, with a ton of stuff to look for on the three towers and everywhere in between. They don't always have to be open, though. I actually really enjoy Death Chamber despite how cramped it can feel. There are timing-based doors to slide through, secret rooms to find, and so many unique hiding spots for the keys to ensure the player will never be able to truly know where every single hiding spot is. It's more labyrinthine, and that's alright. Just another flavor of exploration I personally can't get enough of. It's not to say they perfected treasure hunting or something, not even close. Occasionally there will be a really pace-breaking gimmick that gets in the way of your hunt. Changing water levels in Aquatic Mine, while cool, has the same problem Skydeck does. The switches are all the way at the top, and since you can never see what you've affected in the level until you travel there, you'll never know if you're on the right water level for whichever emerald is beeping. Oftentimes, you'll just have to swim back up and change the water level. It's the same problem I have with Security Hall. Chaos Emerald behind a blue safe? Tough shit, go all the way to the top and switch the blue safes on. I'm not saying these levels can't have more complexity built into their design. I just went over how Death Chamber was more confined and restrictive. The difference is that your gimmick isn't shoved off in the attic somewhere, forcing the player to backtrack all the time. That stuff feels like padding, especially because SA2 changed the radar to only beep for one shard at a time. Now, I actually consider the change to the radar to be a more complicated issue than people make it out to be. Most people seem to believe this was a change purely to pad out the game, to make sure players would have to comb over parts of the level multiple times to find all the shards. I'm not quite convinced. See, one of my biggest problems with Knuckles in SA1 was that finding the emerald shards was too swift a process. In the smaller stages, a lot of that had to do with the radar. It would beep for all three shards at once, and so in the smaller levels, you'd be done in seconds. Therefore, it isn't too crazy to imagine that the radar nerf was implemented to make the smaller levels a little less straightforward. I mean, imagine if Wild Canyon had SA1's radar, it'd be even more pathetic. I don't think it's a perfect solution, obviously. In the much, much larger levels that SA2 provides, the radar is more blatantly annoying. You're already being asked to navigate a large area, why do you have to search the same map five times over? I feel like Mad Space in particular would be a lot more digestible if it had SA1's radar. I actually don't consider Mad Space to be one of the worst levels. I have a lot of fun with it when the shard RNG is nice to me. The gravity mechanics can be a real hassle to get used to, but the only reason they start to infuriate me is due to the radar system being such a bad fit for that specific stage. Basically, the radar's complicated. I don't think it's good, but that also doesn't make SA1's radar good. There's more nuance here than meets the eye. 
I can say that about a lot of the problems the levels face. Some of them, the bigger ones, are more fun and substantial than others, but it doesn't mean that I can't possibly have fun with Security Hall because of an obnoxious gimmick, or Dry Lagoon just because it's a small, straightforward level. I can enjoy the smaller levels more than an SA-1, in part due to the nerfed radar. Clearly, though, they aren't the ideal realization of everything the gameplay style can be. It's a pretty huge step from the original, though. I can't see this as a downgrade in any sense of the word, even if parts of the level are inferior. That's how I feel about all three styles in a broad sense. Every style has its more blatant weaknesses, some that are even a little worse than in the original, but none that come close to making their styles as a whole worse than their original incarnations. SA2 is not the peak of what these styles can offer, they're simply a step towards the ideal. <laughs> well, let's just get down to business then, shall we, Mr. President? I won't bore you with all the details, since I know you are a very busy man. Mr. President, my demands are quite simple. Surrender to the Eggman Empire and make no attempts to resist. Otherwise... Otherwise... Otherwise your country will cease to exist. You have 24 hours to give me your answer. No way! What the? <laughs> I can see how this selection of levels doesn't inspire a ton of confidence. It's a fun set, but many of them have fairly annoying issues, and it isn't exactly clear what the strengths of each playstyle are on first blush. I mean, sure, why not just use all the hint monitors in the Emerald Stages? Once you hit the third monitor, you're basically flat out told where it is. Why not just run around in mech stages and spam the shoot button? Why not just avoid all the ramps and city escape? Just make it to the end of these linear hallways. That's all the game requires of you, after all. This is often how I felt playing Sonic Adventure. When playing Knuckles stages, I'd just look for to call so I could finish quickly. With Tails, I'd fly to the end without a care in the world, skipping most of the level. I only got more out of Sonic's level design because it was an intrinsically rewarding process to explore his levels and find shortcuts. There were zero extrinsic indicators that would tell me how I was supposed to play the game. Sonic Adventure 2 adds an extrinsic indicator, one that seems inconsequential, but is likely the sole reason it remains my favorite Sonic game to this date. The ranking system. If this game did not have a ranking system, I genuinely don't know if I'd still love it as much as I do. Which sounds like hyperbole but just stick with me. This ranking system is what encouraged me to learn the ins and outs of these levels. It pushed me to figure out the most effective and fun ways to play them. Much like Devil May Cry will rank the player on their performance, incentivizing players to switch up their weapons and combos, Sonic Adventure 2's rating system works differently for all three styles, tending toward what's most fun or stylish for each. Ranks are determined by your point tally, which is itself determined by a myriad of different factors. How many enemies you beat, rings collected, tricks performed, basically everything you do has a point total associated with it, and if you reach the point threshold, you'll be given a rank from E to A. Each gameplay style has a set of unique bonuses that the player will need to collect in order to reach their threshold. For Sonic and Shadows levels, it's all about the time bonus. If you reach the level before a certain time, you'll get more points, making it more likely that you get the A rank. For Tails and Eggman, it's about efficient chaining. You'll get points for killing an enemy, sure, but you'll get much more if you get a high chain going. Knuckles and Rouge don't necessarily have a time bonus, but there's a timer for each individual emerald found that resets when you find one. The amount of time it takes you to find each will determine how many points you get at the end. You can quickly figure out what each style requires of you from this. Speed stages are not just about finishing fast, they're also about performing tricks, rail grinding, and defeating a few of the enemies along the way. Mech stages are about chaining together as many enemies as possible without getting hit or losing your lock on, meaning you'll have to think about what you're shooting. Finally, treasure hunting is about how efficiently you can glide through each level to find shards as fast as you possibly can. You have to know how to get around the level quickly, where the rockets are, which walls you can climb up, where you can dig, etc. Each style has a set of discouragements to keep the player on track. You can't dilly-dally for too long in the speed stages, or you won't get the time bonus. You can't spam the shoot button in mech stages and turn your brain off, or you won't get the combo bonus. Finally, you'll lose points for using too many hit monitors, so you'll have to rely on only one or two hints for the A. 
These rank requirements are pretty strict, too. The game isn't afraid to hand out lower ranks for subpar performance. It makes obtaining those A ranks all the more delicious. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this might not be my favorite Sonic game if it didn't have this system and if the system wasn't as strict as it is. Later games, I feel, miss the point of what a ranking system is really meant to achieve. As much as I love Sonic Generations, you get an S rank by sneezing. You may as well not be ranked at the end. All it incentivizes the player to do is not die. In Sonic Adventure 2, getting a B rank is as annoying as it is inspiring. It sucks to get a low rank, hear the barely made it from Sonic, but it is in equal parts motivating. You want to prove to the game that you understand its levels, that you can rip through them stylishly. It has a command over mastery that the rest of the series will never be able to match up to in quite the same way. I'm not saying it magically eliminates every problem I have with the level design. I still get annoyed when I reach Aquatic Mine or Cosmic Wall or Final Chase. Hell, an unfortunate side effect of making the Emerald Sages time-based is that Emerald locations are based on RNG, so you could just be saddled with bad luck. However, what it does do is thread each level together and gives me something to focus on besides the more underwhelming level gimmicks. At least in Cosmic Wall I can focus on getting big chains while on the moving platform. At least in Final Chase I can focus on getting it over with quickly. It's not some kind of cure-all, but it allowed me to look at each of these levels with a different set of priorities, and it's my most played Sonic game to date as a result. It's the only Sonic game I've been confident enough to speedrun. I'm even on the board now. I will say, having practiced the speedrun, the ranking system isn't exactly built for speed. At first, it was incredibly jarring for me to beat a speed stage in record time, only to be met with a lower rank. It's a difficult tightrope to walk. If you just focus on speed, it's easy to ignore most of the level in favor of getting to the end quickly. You won't interact with any of the enemies, you won't find any of the secrets, you won't pull off tricks or do anything fancy. In the classics, in order to speedrun effectively, you had to first learn the level inside and out. You had to explore it first to figure out the route, and then you could blitz through it. I view the ranking system as part of that same learning process. To get A ranks, you have to involve yourself with most parts of the level, leading to a deeper understanding of the design as a result, priming you to beat each level even faster. It sounds a bit silly, I know, but getting these A ranks is extremely fulfilling, and one of the reasons it's such an intensely replayable game. I don't think enough is said about how much mileage SA2 gets out of its levels. There are four additional missions in each level, along with the initial story clear, that each have ranks to achieve. In SA1, the extra missions were usually pretty awful. Bigs were an abhorrent nightmare. Usually it involved beating the level within a certain time, collecting rings, racing an even faster Sonic, I guess? I don't quite buy that he's faster. Sonic Adventure 2 streamlines the mission process. Mission 2 is about how fast you can collect 100 rings. Mission 3 is about finding the lost Chow. Mission 4 is beating the level under the gun of a timer, and the final mission is a redesigned stage layout dubbed as Hard Mode. The only one here I don't like is the fourth mission. It's virtually unchanged from the initial mission and feels like padding. However, the other missions are really fun, and the ranking system allows the player to have an experience separate from the core level. Finding the quickest path to 100 rings asks you to pay attention to where the earliest ring placements are, encouraging the player to find hidden ring boxes and the like. A ranking is solely based on completion time, so you can focus on collecting. It works the best in treasure hunting stages, since those don't have obvious rings to pick up on a linear path. You just have to search for the easiest places to access rings. Lost Chow missions are all about finding secret areas. Often you'll need the Mystic Melody, a power-up you can find hidden in the regular stages. Power-ups in this game are handled so much better than in the original. Instead of clumsily funneling yourself into mandatory upgrades in the hub world, Adventure 2 will place mandatory upgrades inside the levels on your path, and leave truly optional upgrades as hidden rewards for completionists. I'm still not convinced Sonic games need upgrades, but it's a better way to dole them out than in the original, at least for me. Finding the Mystic Melody for each character was really fun. Tails and Eggman have hidden lasers that do more area of effect damage or armor for more health. 
not all of them are winners, the ancient light is about as useless as it's always been, and the sunglasses are kinda lame, even if I do think they look cool. However, they are much more fun to find, and actually give the player more of a reason to revisit earlier levels with newly acquired power-ups. As I was saying, The Lost Chow makes use of this explorative mindset. It's still a time-based challenge, but it's a challenge you have to first approach with a more explorative mind. Finally, Hard Mode is a complete stage revamp. Harder jumps, more enemies, that sort of stuff. The remixes are pretty fun, and you're ranked the same as the main level categories. Plus, if you're not a fan of Emerald RNG, Hard Mode has the same Emerald places every time, at the cost of them being pretty tricky to track down. It might not sound like much, but it's remarkable just how fun these simple little shakeups are, and how efficient they are in terms of reusing content. In the original, reuse was fairly obvious, giving characters the same level with virtually no changes. In SA2, each level is unique, though two characters might share the same visual theme, Radical Highway and Mission Street, Pumpkin Hill and Sky Rail, Lost Colony and Eternal Engine. Instead, the reuse comes from the additional missions, prompting you to play the same level multiple times, but for objectives that shift how you have to play them, besides Mission 4, which sucks. Giving a rank to all the missions adds even more of a reason to check them out, to see how hard mode switches things up, or to see where the hidden Chao is, or to recognize there's a hidden ring in Metal Harbor just for the second mission, or at least, I assume that's what this lone ring is for. I would imagine it hard to make levels for a Sonic game. He moves so fast, the levels need to be huge to accommodate that speed, adding more to the necessary development time. Even with mech and treasure hunting, adding more levels probably would have been a hefty process, so it's cool to see that they were able to make the most of the content in the game without making it feel padded out or frustrating. Going for all the emblems in SA1 was not a comparably fun experience, and I'll leave that there for you to ruminate. Another extra SA2 completely champions over the original is the Chow Garden. Chows are not really my favorite part of these games anymore, and truthfully, it's hard for me to find the words for this side attraction as a result. I considered not even talking about them, but they're core to the series' identity, and I might as well mention them. I find SA2 Chow a lot more engaging to raise since they have so many different forms based on what you feed them and who's doing the feeding. Raising Hero and Dark Chow can even give you hidden bonus gardens. There's just a lot more meat in SA2, and you can select the gardens from the stage select instead of having to head there through a hub world. It's nice to stop by after a mission to deposit your animals and chaos drives. That said, this is still nothing more than a novelty, and I don't have much to say about it that hasn't already been said. It provides ample reason to defeat enemies and explore the levels, but I'd be lying if I said I derived the same enjoyment from it as I did when I was a kid. Both these games have the issue of chow races and karate being complete snooze fests, as you have zero control over whether your chow wins or loses. It's simply down to whether or not you have the better stats. They are damn cute little tykes, though. I wish I could channel my inner child again with this when I really cared about going through all the steps for a Chaos Chow. Nowadays, it feels like a whole lot of work for nothing satisfying in return. Now I know what's going on! The military has mistaken me for the likes of you! So, where do you think you're going with that emerald? Say something, you fake hedgehog! Chaos Control! Wow! He's fast! Hey, it's not his speed! He must be using the Chaos Emerald to warp! My name is Shadow. I'm the world's ultimate life form. There's no time for games. Farewell! Sonic Adventure 2 changes a lot about what the first game established, but the most readily apparent difference is the lack of a hub world. I'm of the belief that while novel, Sonic Adventure's hub world was damaging to its pacing and malleability. I go over this in more detail during my SA1 video, but suffice to say, I think it harmed the amount of stages there could be for each character, and didn't contain much satisfying content that would see you exploring the hub world. It was a glorified level select. 
Pair the removal of the hub world with the streamlined story select, and we've already eliminated most of the first game's pacing and story issues. If you'll recall, my biggest problem with the first game's narrative was how needlessly confusing it was to digest all of it. Chaos's story was spread through all six campaigns at completely random points, often taking away from moments in the individual stories that should have been more impactful. The way in which these stories intersected was also pretty hit or miss, leading to a slew of interesting stories bogged down by an ambitious choose-your-own-adventure format. What I adore so much about the switch to a hero in Dark Story is that it retains the same strengths as the six-character story select. One of the only things I liked about the original's non-linear character order was getting to see other characters show up. Why are they there? What were they doing? In SA2, you've pitted two groups against each other who fight on a regular basis, meaning no matter which one you pick, there will be moments where the other side makes an appearance and you'll be left wondering what they've been up to all this time. You learn from Shadow that Prison Island will blow up in 15 minutes. Where did the plan originate? How did they carry it out? It gets me intrigued to play the dark story. While on paper it's less exciting than six intersecting stories, it's much easier to manage and leads to far greater internal consistency within the individual stories. Every level plays off the next since we're now working as a team. Hero Story starts with Sonic escaping captivity, encountering Shadow, Knuckles and Rouge hunting for pieces of the Master Emerald, Tails going to break Sonic out of prison, with a fun-filled escape sequence until our heroes all meet up in the big city, break into Eggman's desert base, and travel to the Space Colony arc for the climax. Knuckles is kinda on his own mission, so I guess you could say his involvement is tertiary at best, but I'm personally okay with it because the other characters often react to his absence. What's up with that knucklehead anyway? Trying to take over the shuttle. I thought we were toast for sure. Knuckles also doesn't really strike me as one to screw around when the Master Emerald's in danger, so going on a solo mission isn't that jarring. My point is more that this is a much more fun story than anything in the first adventure. There's enough time to build up the antagonistic force, get our heroes pitted up against it, and fight that evil. On the flip side, getting to see the villains team up in the dark story is extremely cathartic. And I think people really take for granted how special it is that we got to play as Shadow, Rouge, and Dr. Eggman himself for an entire story. It's a story with a lot more frenetic energy. Sonic and Shadow have an anime showdown, Eggman blows up an entire island, and then half of the moon. Sonic and friends break into Eggman's pyramid base to steal his rocket to the Space Colony Arc, where the principal three characters duke it out in a battle to either save or destroy the world. Each character has enough time and stage space to make their mark. Sonic's always on the move, eager to escape captivity and face his problems head-on, but that usually leads him to trouble, namely when he gets caught by the military, and then again when he goes to save Amy and Tails at the Space Colony. Sonic never really has a plan, he just charges in and does the best he can. Tails operates as the brains, a little less timid than in the first game, piloting a mech of his own design. He takes matters into his own hands, tracking Sonic down, breaking him out of prison, and even creating a fake Chaos Emerald. He's still a bit inexperienced, though, which lands him into trouble when Eggman tricks him into revealing that Sonic's Emerald was a fake. An interesting part of the hero versus evil dynamic is that each character gets their own thematically fitting rival. You might think Sonic and Eggman are the dynamic duo of hero and villain, but in this case, pitting Tails and Eggman together couldn't have made more sense. Eggman's a mad scientist, a brilliant inventor, and a force to be reckoned with. He's older than Tails, more experienced, and more willing to make the hard calls, at the cost of his not-so-subtle desire to take over the world. Of course, Eggman doesn't care about his companions as much. They formed an alliance out of necessity. He was more than willing to let Rouge die when she was caught by the military. This is wonderfully contrasted when Tails seeks revenge for his fallen friend. Tails cares a lot about Sonic, so his death gives him the courage to come at Eggman with everything he's got. He still has a lot to learn to compete with Eggman's intellect, but his heart is undeniably in the right place. Shadow, on the other hand, is about as stubborn as Sonic. His single-minded desire to wipe out humanity is what motivates his character. Saving Rouge from death was a particularly poignant moment for his eventual development, a time where he went against his own instincts to help someone in need. Deep down, maybe this cold hedgehog isn't so different from Sonic. Knuckles and Rouge are a bit more comedic in their parallels, but it fits their one-track minds. Knuckles is out to restore the pieces of the Master Emerald because it's the sacred gem he's tasked with protecting. He needs to get it back. Rouge is in it for the superficial. She thinks the emerald shards are pretty, and wants to claim them for herself. 
You can obviously see who's in the right and who's in the wrong here. Nevertheless, it's really fun to watch these two eclectic personalities bounce off of each other and even gain a bit of respect near the end. Two very devoted treasure hunters. When all said and done, it's not a very long set of events. It's a standard Sonic vs. Eggman affair. It's a brisk yet entertaining bout between good and evil, one that succeeds in creating memorable moments far more than its predecessor, while also nailing the last story concept where its predecessor absolutely failed. Sonic Adventure 2 has the same general last story setup. All of the stories converge to fight off the big bad, except this time the seeds were planted much more naturally. Where the original would shove to call flashbacks in the characters' faces with little to no reaction from said characters, Sonic Adventure 2 raises natural questions like where did Shadow come from? Why did he want to wipe out humanity? Why was the art created? Stuff like that. They're not questions explicitly raised by the story, but they're questions the player could realistically be asking themselves. Either way, the reveal of Jail Robotnik's doomsday plan is pretty chilling. It's a world-ending event set into motion years prior, accidentally activated by Eggman who had no idea about his grandfather's plans. It provides context as to why Shadow wants to destroy humanity so badly. He harbors the same blinding hatred as Gerald did. Since the Space Colony arc is now on a crash course for Earth, our heroes and villains have to team up to stop it and save the world. Every single character gets a shot in. Tails opens up the way for Eggman, who opens up the way for Rouge, who opens up the way for Knuckles, who opens up the way for Sonic. It's a team effort. No one contribution is more or less important than another's. Everyone needs to head to the cannon's core. We even get an awesome turnaround for Shadow, finally breaking free of the hatred Gerald imbued into him, courtesy of Amy's encouraging pep talk. Always found this moment a little too quick and cheesy for my liking, but it's a good moment for both him and Amy. Which is good, because Amy ain't exactly winning any awards in this game. I hate you! You guys always leave me behind and have all the fun! He beats down the failed prototype ultimate life form, an embodiment of what Shadow could have been without his kindness. Now all the pieces are in play for a banger of a team-up. Sonic and Shadow going super to stop the space colony from crashing into Earth. Functionally, this finale is almost the same as the one against Perfect Chaos. Super transformations, crush 40, heightened stakes, but Sonic Adventure 2 had a much, much stronger build-up to these events. Every single playable character had a role to play in getting Sonic and Shadow where they needed to be. Everyone pitched in. This is a Hail Mary, one that the both of them can't possibly walk away from. Not only is the build-up stronger, so is the bittersweet resolution. Sonic and Shadow's combined chaos control took too much power, and ultimately Shadow couldn't keep up. And so, he died saving humanity, the ultimate defiance of his master's wishes. In the end, he was able to keep his promise to Maria. This ending scene hurts to watch every single time. Despite everything they've all been through, despite what they've all done to each other, everyone shares a somber moment together in remembrance of Shadow. Tails and Eggman ruminate on why Gerald would do something so heinous. Knuckles and Rouge talk about their future. Sonic and Amy express interest in returning home, but not without my favorite line from him in the entire series. Sayonara, Shadow, the Hedgehog. For all their bluster, Sonic and Shadow are kindred spirits. Deep down, they both care about others, and they both want to maintain peace. Their rivalry is one of my favorites in all of fiction. It's incredibly simple, I know that, but I love it all the same. Sonic starts off agitated that he's been mistaken for a criminal hedgehog, but by the end of the story, they're bantering back and forth like old buddies. Sonic really did come to care about Shadow, and won't let his sacrifice go to waste. In the face of Sonic's portrayal as a dumb, joke-cracking machine, and Shadow's portrayal as a cold, unfeeling soldier, it's humbling to remember a time where these characters had a bit more pathos. It's a powerful line, one that's stuck with me all these years. Sonic Adventure 2 isn't a complicated story, and it doesn't really try to do anything you haven't seen before. At the same time, it doesn't overstay its welcome. There are tons of amazing character moments and rivalries, and it's a blast from start to finish. Maria. I just don't know anything anymore. I often wonder why I was created and what my purpose is for being here. Maybe if I go down there, I, I will find the answers. Maybe.
I've tried to make it clear throughout this video that although this is one of my favorite video games, it is nevertheless a step short of its full potential. It is a massive and exciting improvement on a flawed base, one that I enjoy playing to this day, but it's still a bittersweet feeling. I guess you could call me one of those butthurt Sonic fans that's always yearned for an Adventure 3. I don't scream it from the rooftops at every available moment, but it is something I would have liked once upon a time. The problems of Sonic Adventure 2, more than anything, light the way to a sequel which would better iron out those kinks. Make levels that better fit the gameplay styles. Less annoying gimmicks, more streamlined design that fits the core three styles. But time has soldiered on, and despite remarks to the contrary, we never did get a third adventure. It's such a weird base to make a Sonic game out of. Mech shooting and treasure hunting spliced in with high-speed platforming, yeah, it's weird. It doesn't really make any sense, and yet it's something I and many other people enjoy in spite of its out-of-left-field nature. Doubtless, many other people would have loved to see it carried to even greater heights. Sonic Adventure 2 is a very flawed video game, in ways that are perhaps more striking to me than any of my other favorites. There are levels that annoy the living shit out of me, and yet I keep crawling back. That said, the time for Adventure 3 is over. I hope they never try it. Sonic Team has changed. They've changed writers, they've changed the way Sonic plays, they've changed the voice cast, they've changed so much about him. It's a completely different era. And a Sonic Adventure 3 in Sonic's current paradigm would no doubt be an utter disaster. I have a lot of pessimism toward revival projects. Despite my love for returns to form like Crash 4, there's always something there that feels a bit displaced from time. You just can't capture that same spirit 100%, no matter how much you study the level design, the writing, the overall design, I just don't think this is something that can be recreated after the passage of time and exchange of artists especially in the case of Sonic. I hate to be gloomy at the end of a video about one of my favorite games of all time, but it truly does suck that this has to be my favorite Sonic game. That these ideas couldn't have been further improved, that we couldn't get another banging set of levels. For mech and treasure hunting especially, this was the first game where they were really allowed to break into their own, to define themselves in unique levels. Adventure 1, in many ways, felt like a prototype for everyone besides Sonic, and it saddens me that these characters only really got one game to shine. I'm kind of frustrated where Sonic's been lately. I haven't connected with them in a very long time. Playing Adventure 2 again has made that all the more clear. There was a time where this blue hedgehog was the center of my whole world. Now, he's a curiosity. Wonder what I'll try next, I say in the back of my head, remembering the glory days. This isn't meant to be elitist. I don't want to come off that way. I enjoy several of the modern Sonic games a lot, just as I now enjoy a lot of the classics. Mania, even, was fantastic. There's just something about his current direction that feels aimless, like no one really knows what they want to do with them anymore. For all of their faults, returning to the adventure games have reminded me of a time where there was a strange, yet clear vision of what Sonic was. It was a time where I understood him the best, and a time I truly do wish I'll be able to return to soon. Something we get stuck on a lot with Sonic is how it should be. There's a lot of talk about what Sonic should look like, indicative of a series which loves to reinvent itself every couple years. You could call this a bad thing, but Sonic just can't figure out what works and what doesn't. He'd be right, in a sense. Why can't Sonic just stick to one style? After the adventure games, you'd think they'd have all rights to move on to Adventure 3, to refine the ideas they had been steadily improving. Instead, we got... Sonic Heroes. It's actually funny how normal this shift in gameplay style and tone feels in retrospect. True to the character, the franchise has a bit of a commitment problem, which has likely led to the dozens of splinters we now see within its fanbase. At the same time, part of me doesn't blame them for heading in a new direction. Though the adventure games were mostly beloved, the games weren't exactly the faithful translation of the classics that some fans probably wanted. And if I'm honest, though Adventure 3 had several areas in which it could improve and evolve the formula, 
Adventure 2 is a pretty high note for that style of game to go out on. Why not experiment with what Sonic can be in 3D? An innocent question. Once upon a time. So it was that Sonic Heroes came into being, and with it a style of gameplay that no one saw coming. You know, the more I write for this intro, the more I realize how Sonic Lost World released in essentially the same situation, adopting a new and different style of gameplay coming off one of the most beloved and critically acclaimed games in the franchise. Sonic Team are never ones to let a good idea stick. Eh? Despite it all, I kinda love it. There's a magic to Sonic Heroes, however unorthodox, and I wanna explore that. Why do I love Sonic Heroes, the beautiful, lovable mess? The Sonic franchise is unique in that its ideas are rarely ever appealing on paper. Sonic Adventure 2 is my pride and joy. It came together really well, but I don't know that I'd necessarily be singing the same tune were I only to glimpse its concept. It's got mech shooting set in modern-day San Francisco, with actual human beings who send their military robots to lock Sonic in prison. It's kind of weird. But I find that in spite of its ludicrous premise, maybe even sometimes because of its ludicrous premise, it remains a kick-ass video game. It doesn't really resemble what the classics had established as a traditional Sonic game, and yet I still think it's one of the best. Get upset at me for this, I know you will. Super Mario 64 is really nothing like the classic 2D Mario games. It had a completely different structure and style focused around collecting objects in large sandboxes, with only occasional platforming, and people loved it. So much so that it created an entire subgenre. So I say, to hell with the concept of a series or franchise needing to be anything at all. Why do we care what it should be? If it's good, if it's fun, no matter how ridiculous it sounds, why should that matter? I mean, really listen to me when I say that conceptually, Sonic Heroes sounds like a bad idea. Twelve characters split into four different teams. Speed characters will control like Sonic usually does. Flight characters will shoot teammates at enemies and fly over gaps. And power characters will break objects and dispatch foes. Each character will be able to level up throughout the course of an act. The acts will be much longer on average, and many of them will have slower paced sections focused on combat. If I had no prior experience, and you just told me this basic premise, I'd naturally be a little hesitant. I don't exactly have anything against destroying enemies in a Sonic game, that's just another part of the platforming. But a focus on combat, where enemies will don larger and larger health bars, where part of the onus for the player to switch characters is in order to better deal with mini-bosses and the like is a little outside my comfort zone. I don't know that I'm interested in a Sonic game with so much stop and start pacing. But much like the mech shooting gameplay of the adventure games makes very little sense on paper, I don't think words can really do heroes justice. When you sit down to play, or at least when I sit down to play, it starts to click. You're constantly switching between characters, trying to find the optimal way through enemy encounters to finish levels as quickly as possible. They ease you into it with Seaside Hill, where colored gates forcibly switch you to another character. Through this, you learn a set of priorities. Speed characters specialize in covering longer distances. They can quickly homing attack through enemies, they can perform the light speed dash, and they can rocket excel but they're not exactly primed for combat. When you've just begun a stage, trying to kill enemies with them takes far too long, which is why you'll likely want to switch to the power character to deal with them. Power characters are much slower, but they have more combat utility. They can throw their teammates at enemies, they can dish out huge amounts of damage, generally they're your room cleaners. And then, sometimes, you'll run into a set of flying enemies in a chain. Sure, you can deal with them using Sonic or Knuckles, but again, it'll be a lot more awkward. Why not just switch to a flight character to stun those flying enemies, or flat out kill them depending on their level? You can pretty much use anyone to fight, but there's always a clearly better answer depending on what level your characters are. If your power or flight character is underleveled, maybe it's better to remove those annoying shields with the speed character's tornado attack, making it easier for the power character to finish the job. But if the speed character is a higher level, they can probably just kill the enemies themselves. It's the same for every character. And as you progress to future stages, the enemies will become much more resistant to certain character types. They'll start introducing metal flying enemies, which have to first be stunned by a flight character. 
and then dealt with using a power character. They'll introduce these big walkers with giant hammers, best dealt with using a power character, but maybe you can use a flight character to slow its movement and give you more opportunity for damage. The helmet variants only have one weak spot on top of their head, practically forcing you to figure out the fastest way to bring them to the ground. I think there's a really great sense of fluidity to the levels because of this. Whether it's a large gap you have to cross with a flight character, or a mini boss you have to take on with a power character, while it sounds a little bit like Simon says, you usually have to put the pieces together yourself, which is what makes it a satisfying decision. It isn't always just, oh, here's a light dash path, let's Let's use Sonic, there are so many moments where you can use pretty much any character, and it's up to you to decide which of these three goobers will get you through this section as fast as possible. Sound familiar? A fundamental aspect I look for in Sonic games is their ability to be replayed and mastered by proficient players. Does it get more fun the more I play it? Do I learn more about these levels that I didn't know before? Can I figure out new ways to use the tools available to me to decrease my time spent in a level and raise my rank at the end? I think, for the most part, Team Sonic's levels follow this design philosophy. Seaside Hill and Ocean Palace introduce you to the basics. Sonic's fast, you should use him for the light dash rings and for narrow strips of land. You gotta switch to Knuckles when there are big blocks in the way, enemies aplenty, or gusts of air to ride. You switch to Tails when you need to reach higher, farther platforms, or to deal with airborne robots. There are some other things to consider, like who you switch to before entering a cannon, but for the most part, you're simply getting a good feel for where and when to switch in these two acts. As you progress, you run into more of these opportunities. Grand Metropolis introduces turtles you need to tornado attack with Sonic to flip over. If you can collect enough power-ups, though, you can just skip that step and kill them instantly, moving on to the next section much quicker. A lot of the time, exploring a level will reward you with these level-ups, giving you incentive to seek out hidden alcoves. These sections in the power plant are a really interesting showcase of a tried and true Sonic staple, vertical pathway selection. To stay on top, you have to make sure you land on each platform with tails while taking out the enemies. Falling will mean you need to take some extra time fighting enemies, most likely decreasing your rank at the end. This is where you're meant to flex your mastery over the level. There are sections like this dotted all over the game, and it feels as good as it ever has to maintain these higher pathways at a quick pace. I like combat in this game the most when it serves as a punishment for suboptimal play. It means that you can come back later and skip the fights entirely, show them who's boss. In addition to sections like these, each level has a unique gimmick to play with. Grand Metropolis and Power Plant are all about these moving platforms. Casino Park and Bingo Highway put you onto pinball tables. Rail Canyon and Bullet Station revolve around grind rails. I love that not only each level, but each act has something new to contend with. It helps to keep the player on their feet. Rail Canyon has a lot of rail hopping, switching, and jumping. I think there's a healthy mix of spectacle, watching Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles blast off at high speeds, trains circling around them, and platforming, where you have to jump after crashing or switch to the correct rail. And by the next level, you'll be in a forest that springs to life before your eyes when it rains, bringing grind rails to life as you grind on them. My point is, even if one or two of these gimmicks aren't your cup of tea, they shake things up so much that you're never really stuck there for too long. This mechanical variety pairs incredibly well with the stage theming. I will go on record saying that in terms of aesthetic feel, Sonic Heroes is the best of the best. You spend two acts in each location. Seaside Hill is based more in the beach portion of the level. You see more of the green, the sand, and the rocks. But as you move further inland, you get to this white and red ocean palace standing above the water. Every level follows suit. You go from the frog forest, high as the clouds, the jungle far below you. The second act sees you descend into the thick of it, the lost jungle below, where you get to see more of the swamp and encounter the poisonous frogs. I love that frog forest has a more upbeat, cheery musical track. But as soon as you reach the jungle, it slows down. There are more enemies to fight. You're brought back down to Earth, in a sense. And if I'm honest, this is probably the worst that the level theming has to offer. 
Rail Canyon weaves beautifully into the larger plot, where Eggman is going to enact his evil doomsday in three days. By the time you reach Rail Canyon, you're running pretty low on time, so you enter the level already on the grind rails, barreling through the canyon and into the bullet station, where you systematically destroy each of them, shooting yourself out of Eggman's giant cannons to cross long distances in no time flat. There's a great sense of urgency here. The stakes are high, you really gotta get moving. And what better way to do that than to kick the guitars into high gear? Once you emerge from the jungle, you find yourself in a spooky castle, getting tossed and turned around by these gravity orbs. It's a little more creepy, a little more confusing, and so the backing track reflects that atmosphere. And as you trudge further into the mansion, you get the feeling that something isn't quite right here. Optical illusions, enemies flying out of paintings, entering strange ethereal dimensions. It's a mystic mansion, all right. One you need to get out of as fast as you can. But the star of the show, by far one of the best levels in Sonic history that I'm honestly not sure can ever be topped, you land on one of Eggman's ships, and... A level where you jump from ship to ship, blowing up Eggman's giant battleships, flying higher than the clouds, you're in the heart of it now, and there's nothing that's gonna stop you. After destroying most of his fleet, you finally reach the end game, Eggman's final fortress. An impossibly huge ship to navigate, and Eggman sends out the cavalry, some of the toughest enemies you've ever faced, in the heart of enemy territory. Lasers firing, it's the final shot before facing off against Eggman. There's no doubt in my mind that this is my favorite set of levels in all of Sonic and the soundtrack which accompanies them is also one of my all-time favorites. I think Heroes actually does quite a lot to harken back to the aesthetic feel of the classics. These levels would feel right at home on the Genesis, both visually and musically, all from a gameplay style which, on paper, sounds like an absolute disaster. So, the trouble with this video is that there's still a significant chunk of time left for you to watch. All I've done up to this point is praise the hell out of it, and the title is Sonic Heroes is a Lovable Mess. I'm sure a lot of you have been waiting for the other, uh, what's the phrase? I love Sonic Heroes, I truly do, and yet I do think it's also a really messy one. I love Sonic Adventure 2 pretty much in its entirety, without too many disclaimers. Yeah, there's a few things here and there I don't like, a few nitpicks. Ultimately, I think it's a really well-rounded game that most people can enjoy. Despite its divisiveness amongst fans, I personally have a hard time viewing it as all that messy. I just think it's an iconic classic, sorry to say. I can't say that for Heroes, so my love for it comes with many an asterisk. The first of which concerns the lack of polish. This is something present in both of the adventure games to a lesser extent, though I feel like a lot of it is somewhat overblown. Heroes, though? Yeah, you really do get the feeling that this was a rushed project. It's not just the glitches. I mean, oh boy, those do exist, let me tell you. It's worth noting that the GameCube version is much less glitchy than the others, but you still get some pretty weird interactions sometimes. Flying off ramps wrong, rail hopping, breaking entirely, and getting stuck on pinball tables. But less than the lack of technical polish, I think the general feeling of jank 
can be attributed more so to things like the characters sliding around like the ground's made of butter. At high speeds, it can be a little hard to precisely maneuver Sonic without flying into walls, and when you pair movement that chaotic with bottomless pits and enemies around those bottomless pits, sometimes you'll just be tapping away at the attack button with knuckles, and the next moment you've slid off into the abyss below. Maybe you'll die in this crocodile section, because trying to judge when you're supposed to hit the button can be really awkward on these jump ropes. Or maybe you'll be in Casino Park, where the pinball tables are nonsensical enough to drive you mad, and characters just sort of fall off and disappear for no discernible reason. Something about the way you control in the pinball sections isn't right. It's like you're constantly wrestling with the controls to get where you need to go. I suppose it emulates pinball well, in that sense. God forbid you enter a special stage, a requirement to unlock the last story. It's a novel idea, inside a tube chasing Chaos Emeralds, picking up orbs, and avoiding spike balls. But the way Sonic and friends control inside this inner tube is downright god-awful. Good luck staying on the bottom. If there's so much as a 15 degree turn, you'll start spinning around your directional change along with it, and you'll lose control for a minute. All the while, the emerald gets away and you have to replay the stage again, pick up the damn key, and never get hit by a single enemy just so you can fail the special stage again. Like, in theory, finding a key hidden in the level and taking it to the end without getting hit is a neat challenge, but a lot of the time, whether or not you get hit or die isn't up to you. It's up to whatever mood Heroes happens to be in. It's to the point where sometimes I'll run into a frustrating enough accident that I'll have to take a bit of a break, or risk tearing my head off. Eventually, though, you can learn to roll with the punches, and mostly avoid these problems. Air attack with knuckles on treacherous ground so you don't risk flying off the edge with a ground attack. Jump from rail to rail manually instead of trying to switch the intended way. Never switch to another character on the pinball tables. The player shouldn't have to do this, but if you want to avoid the headaches, you might as well get used to it. Sorry about the boss fights, though. You're gonna need to take some Tylenol or something. There's no getting around how tedious they can be. Aside from Egghawk, where you can just slam Knuckles into it and the fight's over, each of these boss battles is uniquely frustrating. Whether it be the endurance tests of Egg Albatross and the enemy gauntlets, or the absolutely batshit confusing character battles, there's not much to love here. Egg Albatross is a cool idea, a giant chip you have to take apart piece by piece, but in practice, it's a bit of a slog. Either you're a speedrunner and you can kill it in 5 seconds by baiting the thing towards you and spamming Knuckles' ground attacks, or you take the casual approach and spam the hell out of Sonic's homing attack. There's just not a lot to do here. And if you break a section while over a grind rail, the camera will come back at an awkward angle causing you to run into an enemy and fall off. Trust me, this has happened to me more times than I care to admit. So inevitably, whenever I reach this boss, I turn my brain off and mash. Riveting. The enemy gauntlets are a bit more stimulating. It's fun to try collecting as many level ups as possible, finding the quickest and most effective ways to deal with the enemies for a high rank. Good on them for making the boss A ranks entirely time based, so I don't feel too bad for trying to cheese them. They're just not all that exciting. The second one in particular really outstays its welcome. There are only so many types of enemy in the game, and so many combinations they can throw at you. Enemies work really well as obstacles to your speed. They're not necessarily going to work quite the same when you're plopped into a room and forced to wail on them. There are some sections like that in Final Fortress that get on my nerves a little bit. Team Blast also means you can just skip the hardest ones for free. I kind of like Team Blast in the levels because you have to decide where the best place to use it is. You don't want to hang on to it for too long or you'll just be wasting time, but you don't want to use it prematurely and also lose time. But in the enemy gauntlets, you pretty much just let it rip as soon as you get it. Conceptually, character battles should be the best of this bunch. There's a rock, paper, scissors thing going on with the formations. You've got to use one formation to counter another. In theory, of course. In practice, these battles play out like you suddenly gave your controller to a monkey and it started mashing random buttons. Will you win? Uh, it's like a 50-50. There are a few strategies that seem consistent enough. Tornado attacking rapidly in the GameCube version, or flying off as far as you can to bait your enemies into jumping after you and into the pit, only works some of the time. If you try taking these character battles seriously, what's going to end up happening is essentially nothing. You'll get stunned a lot, your teammates will end up dead, and then you'll be at the mercy of an endless stun lock. It's not fun. What's worse is that you won't just be doing these boss encounters once, you'll be doing them four times. 
Yeah, so your favorite part of Sonic Adventure? Fighting Chaos four a dozen times? Why don't we do that for every one of our awful boss fights? What a thrill. I guess I don't mind repeating Egg Emperor, he feels like the most well-realized fight. There's a section where you're clearly meant to play as Sonic, chasing after him as you avoid vertical and horizontal sword slices. Then, when he stops to throw rockets at you, you've gotta break his shield with knuckles, and maybe stop the cannons if they're bothering you too much. Then, when the core is exposed, you can use the flight character, or pretty much anyone depending on your level. Picking up the power-ups along the way will help make this process go by a little more quickly. You get a nice incentive to switch, the fight is a nice length, and the music is kick-ass. No complaints there. Yeah, so I think we've already clued in on the next point of contention. You have to play Sonic Heroes four times in a row to unlock the last story. Now, it's not as laborious as it might sound initially. Each of the four teams have slightly altered levels. Though they all go to the same locations, in the same order, there will be a few additions to spice up the proceedings. Team Dark levels will generally be longer, filled with tougher enemies, more bottomless pits. It's functionally this game's hard mode. On the flip side, you get Team Rose. Shorter levels, less enemies, invincibility boxes aplenty, and a bunch of gates which force you into team formations, taking away a lot of the decision making associated with form changing. Easy mode. Finally, Team Chaotix is a bit of a mission mode, where you're tasked with collecting items or destroying objects. Even as a concept, this idea is a bit of a stretch. No matter how you dress things up, each level will have the same visuals, the same music, the same basic premise, and the same boring boss fights to top everything off. Yeah, you'll see a few new sections of the level, there'll be tougher enemies, or you'll be looking for snails, but at the end of the day, there will be a lot of moments where you're traversing basically the same stretch of level, doing the same platforming challenges, or fighting the same enemies. There is a difference, you can feel it when you drop in, but it all tends to blur together for me. There's Team Sonic, and then there's... the rest. Team Dark is probably the closest to what I would ideally want from a system like this. As I said, it's a hard mode. They'll start throwing you more difficult enemies earlier on, they'll add more to the level, they'll ask you to do some tougher platforming. It's a neat way to re-experience old levels, and since you're controlling a set of characters which don't play off each other in the same upbeat way that Team Sonic do, you get a vibe which is much more serious. It's kind of interesting to see the same basic events, except the main players are swapped out. For that alone, I find the second playthrough just as engaging as the first. But that charm doesn't really extend to baby mode and mission mode. Team Rose is so pathetically easy, so blindingly short, and so narratively pointless that I struggle to think of a justifiable reason for it to really be here. Like yeah, technically you can pick whichever team you want from the start, so theoretically the player could pick Team Rose first, but it seems like a weird way to implement an easy mode. I have never started with Team Rose, because Team Sonic is the standard route. On the off chance I'm not feeling Team Sonic, I can try Team Dark for a functionally identical, slightly harder run of the same game. But with Team Rose, it's always just gonna be Sonic Heroes baby mode. You get a good tutorial in the first two acts of Team Sonic, and the tutorial act you start Team Rose off with, which is much more patronizing, is selectable at any time for struggling players. I mean, I'm thankful it makes getting the Chaos Emeralds less of a chore, doesn't really mean I enjoy playing it. By the time I get the cool new characters from Knuckles Chaotix, it's already my fourth run around the block. Yeah, maybe this time I'm hunting for snails in Ocean Palace instead of reaching a goal ring, but the level design is pretty much the same. You still run down pathways, you still beat up enemies, glide up air shafts, whatever. You're just looking for snails along the way. And some of the missions, like Rail Canyon, are just, yeah, I need you to make it to the end of the level. Cool. Thanks. Really making the most out of my fourth trek through Rail Canyon, aren't we? Now, one could say that this is yet another way that Sonic Heroes embodies the essence of the classic Sonic games. You pick another character, run through the same levels, and even get to see new pathways or completely altered level design depending on who you pick. Except, in Sonic Heroes, you get an entirely new story for each team, so each of them are like their own little episodes that you can come back and play whenever you want. I really do wish this was the case, but alas, it never is that simple. 
I feel like the thing that bothers me about Heroes the most is the way it goes about structuring its four stories. Yeah, so you can consider me one of those filthy monkey brains who likes when my Sonic games have a bunch of eclectic characters. I don't know, I always liked that we seemed to pick up a new playable Amigo with each game. As Sonic's cast has grown larger, the possibilities for more interesting stories to tell have grown in turn. I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong, I'll always love a good Sonic vs. Eggman with Tails and Knuckles to tag along. The story here is simple. Eggman says he'll do something evil in a couple days, they vow to stop him. It takes them through a bunch of colorful locations, they have a few run-ins with the other teams, a lot of... banter... I think, you know, sometimes it's funny and endearing, and I like it. We have jungle mushrooms on my island too, but not this huge. Ancient civilization established on the sea. This place is really beautiful. Primary target is Eggman. Don't forget it. But sometimes I do wish they'd shut up, yeah, I'll give you that. I dig the simple vibes we get here when compared to the more ambitious stories they were telling in the adventure games. I even like the more lighthearted tone. Sometimes. Sonic and Friends are a bit more cheesy than usual, there's a bit more camp, and maybe it's just because I grew up playing it, but I can't help but smile when Knuckles starts teasing tales about ghosts, or Sonic talks about cracking that egghead wide open and wanting to party. It really doesn't take itself very seriously, but I find that it does it in a way that feels at least a little self-aware when compared to more modern attempts at doing something similar. Maybe it's just that I like Ryan's voice for Sonic more. I don't want to think it's something that negligible which makes me appreciate the game's writing, but who knows? I'm 23. Technically, I'm a Zoomer. Maybe this is just the cringy kid clawing out of my mouth. Team Dark and Team Chaotix are similarly really cool stories on their own. After the masterclass ending of Sonic Adventure 2, I'm still a bit weirded out that they chose to immediately resurrect Shadow like this, but at least the way they did it allows for a bit of mystery. Who brought him back? Is he a robot? Is that why he has no memory? Sonic's yet another property which exists under capitalism to appeal to as many people as possible to sell as much useless shit as possible. In other words, every property under capitalism. Yay! So Shadow coming back was pretty much inevitable. If he's gonna come back, I'm glad they were able to introduce it in Heroes, and they didn't solely try to bring him back through the game, which came after this one. Team Dark probably has the best team dynamic anyway, so it was worth it for that alone. A traitorous government spy working with the amnesiac ultimate life form and a maniacal rogue Eggman robot. It makes for an amusing combo. You two ready? Warning. Immediate destruction if distracted. Man, I really used to love Shadow, didn't I? It wasn't just some fluke, there was a time where I enjoyed how he was written. How funny. Shadow is still so cocky here, he was always envisioned as the dark mirror to Sonic. He's not some super edgy, angry guy. He naturally embodies the confidence and quick wit of Sonic, with only a slightly darker and more serious edge to him. I like that Omega and Shadow are a bit confrontational at first, but slowly warm up to each other as the story progresses. I think the dialogue being more light-hearted has had the side effect of making Shadow's commentary in particular a little too self-aggrandizing. There's a point where Shadow just says, I will find out who I am at the beginning of Frog Forest, and it's a little bit of a random thing for him to blurt out, kind of strange. It's also a little weird how calm Sonic is when they meet up. Something doesn't entirely add up with this whole Shadow situation. The way his comeback is written could have been tuned slightly better, but it's still the Shadow I know and love. Getting to play as him again in a story that's meaningful for his character is all I really need out of this exchange. Team Chaotix is an absolutely brilliant way to repurpose a set of older characters. A group of detectives barely making ends meet, living for the next job. They're essentially the big old goofballs of Sonic Heroes, in the best way possible. It just seems like they're having a blast, I don't know how else to describe it. I can see why a lot of people would find Charmy annoying, but I just love how much he seems to be enjoying himself. 
He's elated at the idea they have a new job to do. Espio is cool and calculated, kinda quiet, but he lets his innocence show every now and then. I mean, he starts saying that he'll unleash his ninja power, or whatever. Dude's a total dork. And Vector's the big brute keeping them together, the muscle, the leader, and the terrible singer. Their team blast makes me smile every time I see it. So we've got three cool little stories to go through, and then... Team Rose. <sighs> Sonic is framed, there's a misunderstanding where Amy and the others think Sonic stole Cream's Chow and Froggy. They go off and do levels, get them back. There's not much going on here. Though the pairing of Amy, Cream, and Big is pretty well done, I'll give them props for that. They fit really well together, and I never would have expected it. But hey, it mostly works, and I love that all of the teams get some crossover moments here and there. They really do have to stretch logic to make it work, though. Man, who are those creeps over there? What's up, SBO? And you are... Just what do you think you're doing here? Who's this broad? Our client's adversary, perhaps. You mean the bad guy? You guys don't fool me! I know what you're after! Better stay out of my way! Couldn't have come up with a better way for that fight to start, eh? Like, they actually went through the effort of making Team Chaotix collect Chow in the Lost Jungle right before encountering Team Rose, so at least there's a reason for them to fight there that makes sense from a narrative perspective, but Team Dark and Team Chaotix... Uh... Yeah, I guess theoretically you could just play this game and treat the other teams as alternate ways to play the same game. You don't really have to do them all if you don't want to, you can just come back at a later date and play another character if you want. But that isn't really what Sonic Heroes is. There's a last story to unlock, where all of these disparate storylines intersect. Yeah, we've done this song and dance before. I really do respect the way this crossover is envisioned. Instead of a regular bout against Eggman, Metal Sonic is the main antagonist masquerading as Eggman. He's collecting data from various teams to gain enough power to evolve into his big, epic final boss form. I think this is a really cool way to bring Metal Sonic into 3D. It's appropriate, and I'll always get a kick out of seeing everyone come together for the final hurrah. There is a very easy pathway into my heart. Unfortunately, I think this final story lands more on the Adventure 1 end of the spectrum, in that the way it's written and structured is so much more messy than it really needs to be. You need to play these four stories in a row and collect the Chaos Emeralds across the seven levels with any of the teams. You'll be playing the same levels with very minor alterations four times over until you're just dropped into the last story, where suddenly Metal Sonic reveals himself, evolves, and everyone starts fighting. Sonic goes super, Tails and Knuckles are put in some frankly lame bubbles. I wanted to see some super forms. They defeat Metal Sonic and all's well that ends well. I guess. Man, I just don't know. There are some parts of this final confrontation that are totally worth slogging through four playthroughs to reach. Hearing the best song from Crush 40 play as you battle Metal Sonic in the skies, fending off missiles, having Knuckles rip through battleships thrown at you from Eggman's fleet, it's a pretty damn epic finale, and I like that the other teams play a role in defeating him. But at the end of the day, they're fighting a copy-paste, relatively simple boss fight where you switch forms based on whatever color you're shown three times over until you launch into the super portion. It's hard to get over how quickly everything happens. The Metal Sonic reveal, everyone coming together, fighting, and then the conclusion. Is it really worth the uphill battle it takes to reach when your reward is less than half an hour of new content? I'm not even asking for something as in-depth as the finale to Sonic Adventure 2, and yet I can't help the feeling that this was a massive step down. I know this is asking for too much, I'm not even saying this would have been possible for Sonic Team to have achieved in a reasonable amount of time, but this whole thing really would have hit better if the teams each had their own set of levels. I know, I know, the game's rushed as it is, would have been impossible. I'm just telling you how it is. The fact of the matter is, playing these levels so many times gets extremely tiring, and playing this extra boss fight feels less like a culmination of various story threads and more like an extra little bonus. Ultimately, it's hard for me to say that it's worth it to play all four. There's a reason I've only fully played this game two or three times throughout my life, and yet I've played Team Sonic more times than I can count. Thus, here I am at the exact same mental headspace I found myself with Sonic Adventure 1. Team Sonic is great, everything else is a bit... less. 
Nevertheless, Sonic Heroes is one of my favorites. It's still a struggle to explain, really. By all accounts, it doesn't seem like I should love it. Much like Sonic Adventure, there's one part of the game that I continue to play over and over again, and there are other parts I can take or leave. But as exhausting as four different playthroughs is, as much as I wish the game was structured differently, as much as I wish it got more time in the oven, a chance to iron out the frustrating kinks, at the end of the day, these are basically the same levels. Whether they're more difficult, more of a cakewalk, or they ask you to defeat every enemy, these are the same set of kick-ass levels with amazing visual theming and some of the best music in the series. I flat out don't like Sonic Adventure's full package. I like a small slice of it. But Sonic Heroes? Yeah, it's a huge mess, but at its core, it's fun. I like replaying it. Sure, maybe I play Team Sonic more than the rest, but coming back to finally play every team again for the first time in a long while, I had a good time. There are sections in Sonic Adventure where I just wanted to be doing something else. Playing as Tails, Amy, and Big was kind of miserable, with Knuckles and Gamma only managing to feel like decent side attractions to the main event. And on top of that, you end up running around the overworld way more than is necessary playing a bunch of the same levels again. A lot of that game is a slog to revisit. I don't feel that with Heroes. It's still a series of highs and lows, but they're much more consistent and much more manageable. No matter how many times you have to play it, at least you're pretty much playing the same game the whole way through. It's not so much a start drop off Mount Everest as much as it is driving down a road full of potholes. But hey, it got me where I needed to be. It's a mess, it's not pretty, but it's a hell of an enjoyable time. It'll never be easy to explain why I love playing it so much, but hey, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Love doesn't make sense. It doesn't follow a set of rules. I love Sonic Heroes for the mess that it is, and I think I came to terms with that a long time ago. It probably sounds a bit silly to some of you, but Shadow the Hedgehog is a very important character to me. He's the reason why I'm in love with the dark and edgy why I adore rival dynamics, and why I'm addicted to redemption stories. He taught me a different kind of cool, one opposite to Sonic, the perfect yin to his yang. It's such a shame, then, that it seems like the game which introduced him was also the peak of his character, since it's been slim pickings ever since. Outside of a decent showing in Heroes in 06, he essentially dropped off the face of the earth as far as the mainline games are concerned, and I think this was, at least in part, responsible for that. It's really sad that this game was Shadow's last major hurrah, the one which made him into a meme, an internet laughingstock, and in my opinion, forever ruined the perception of his character. Yet, it's one I have an odd relationship with. Shadow was my favorite character even when I was younger, so you better believe I begged my parents for Shadow the Hedgehog. I wanted it so badly that I vividly remembered the dream I had where I was playing it before I got it for my birthday. I have a lot of hours logged in Shadow the Hedgehog, and I have a lot of complicated, almost contradictory feelings surrounding it. I never quite find myself agreeing with those who hate it, nor those who love it. I'd actually say I feel both hate and love for it, strange as that may sound. Shadow in general feels like quite a loaded topic these days, so I'm excited to finally talk not only about the game, but the impact it's had on this character and this franchise. In keeping with what Sonic Heroes re-established for the character, Shadow continues the hunt for his lost memory. During his search for answers, dangerous aliens invade Earth, taunting a connection to Shadow, which prompts a choose-your-own-adventure-style progression. Search for answers, protect the planet, doom its inhabitants, or gather the Chaos Emeralds and attain the ultimate power. It's all up to you. Shadow's structure feels to me like an adventure fanfiction. There's an earnestness to it that's so cringe that it almost circles back and becomes a little endearing, with over 300 possible routes, names like Subjugating Heaven and Earth, and the licensed music steeped in that 2000s edge. This is genuinely funny to me, what can I say? Where's that damn fourth Chaos Emerald? Since you have so much freedom over where Shadow goes, he's basically just a vehicle to create your own wacky fanfiction. You plop into a level and decide then and there who Shadow is going to help, 
Consistency be damned. To its credit, you can create some interesting stories. You can aid the Black Arms up to the very end, but experience a change of heart after meeting Rouge in a similar fashion to what happened with Amy in SA2. You can search for answers, only to find you were created by the Black Arms to destroy the world. Hell, you can all but save the world, only to turn on Sonic last minute so you can keep the power for yourself. Why? I mean, why not? This is a no-holds-barred playground to explore the character of Shadow the Hedgehog. What you find is occasionally boring and often makes zero sense, but there's the odd pathway every now and then with a complete and satisfying story to tell. In the very limited way that Shadow the Hedgehog is allowed to be satisfying, of course. I've spent enough time dancing around the elephant in the room, so let's just jump into it full force. Profanity, guns, all that fun stuff. Now, are weapons like this new to the Sonic franchise? No, in fact, even since the beginning, Eggman's badniks were shooting projectiles at Sonic. As the series has gone on, though, those projectiles became more and more realistic until it culminated with the release of Sonic Adventure, where this happened. <laughs> With the introduction of humans, it naturally follows there would be a military presence. In SA2, that military presence played more of an active role, having killed Maria and being responsible for Gerald Robotnik's darker aims. Given the natural progression of the series, even though putting these two games side by side feels a bit... odd, it's hard for me to say that it doesn't or can't fit naturally with a few tweaks here and there. After all, even in the classic games, you had the bad futures from Sonic CD and the various factories Eggman used to devastate the planet. Darker themes are not foreign to Sonic, and Shadow is already a character with a darker backstory. A game exploring said character is likely going to have a more mature tone as a consequence. I think where it loses a lot of people is its attempts to act mature and edgy, which often fall flat. You get the sense that Shadow telling Eggman he's going straight to hell was meant to be a powerful line or something, but it just isn't. Every time I hear this, I can't help but laugh. I mean, they're really trying here, aren't they? Even when I was a young lad, Shadow still felt like tonal whiplash to me. My parents must not have known about the swearing or they'd have never bought me the game. It is interesting, though. Your perception of who Shadow is and how he acts in this game is entirely dependent on the routes you choose, and which ones you ultimately believe in. The story intentionally leaves the canon route ambiguous, using them more as character explorations and what-if scenarios. I think the pieces are there to make this a cool game for Shadow. You can see where it really tries to make the most of this premise. Bringing back the Chaotix mission structure makes a lot of sense. You can't have the player run to the end every time, they need to be able to make choices. What better way to do that than to expound upon the system introduced in Heroes. It's unfortunate, then, that there had to be so many missions, since it obviously comes with diminishing returns. You can tell they came up with several kinds of missions, and copy-pasted them with different flavors. Chasing after the President's plane and destroying it is a nice objective. You have to keep accumulating more and more ammunition and sending the plane down longer, more dangerous pathways. It also makes a lot of sense for a dark mission. Black Doom obviously wants the President taken care of as soon as possible. It's a fantastic way to give you that evil power fantasy. It isn't so amusing when they do that same thing again in Iron Jungle and Lethal Highway, because they clearly didn't have any better ideas. They do this a lot. Activate the shiny objects to make the ruins float, then destroy them all to make them fall. In fact, they're very fond of destroy, activate, four random objects for some vague reason that might be helpful. And then there's the favorite default. Wipe out X amount of human, alien, or robot. In some cases, that tally is incredibly strict and forces you to find every single enemy, and others are more lenient. Why? I have no idea, but it's really annoying, and it sucks that Westopolis has two of these missions, both requiring you to hunt down every single enemy. Not a great first impression. It's maddening because I genuinely believe this system has so much potential. My favorite mission is the one where you race Sonic to the Chaos Emerald aboard the Ark. It's a playful callback that's totally in line with Sonic's character. Yeah, maybe it's a glorified timer, but it's contextually appropriate and puts you in the same headspace as Shadow, remembering what he went through in SA2 and where his rivalry with Sonic peaked. I just wish there were more missions like this, since as it stands, most of them feel superfluous. But hey, this game has a ranking system, so surely that would elevate the fun of even the most boring missions, right? 
Uh, Thus far, I've talked about how ranking systems are a genius idea. They give you a reason to master each character and to learn the ins and outs of each stage. I think it works best when it goes beyond a simple time attack and encourages you to focus on being stylish and cool. Shadow seems to be trying for the same thing leaning into the hero and dark mission structure in order to promote different playstyles. During a hero mission, dark actions will subtract from your overall total, while hero points will add to it, with the base of your points coming mostly from the time bonus. The goal, then, is to finish levels fast, while also taking the time to defeat certain enemies for extra points, emphasizing the raw power of the ultimate life form, which I think fundamentally sets Shadow apart from Sonic. Now, this would be great if the rankings were well-tuned, but, uh, they aren't. Most missions have an extremely lenient time bonus, meaning you can meander around for quite a long time and still get the A rank if you finish in a reasonable amount of time. Because it's so dependent on your time bonus, dying several times in a level doesn't even matter since it only resets your hero in dark points. You'll still get the ridiculous time bonus if you finish fast, which in my opinion rewards fairly sloppy play in a way that feels bad. Piss easy ranking systems like this are a huge pet peeve of mine. If it isn't going to challenge me in a meaningful way, what's the point of even having it in the first place? It also doesn't help that there's a ranking for every individual mission, meaning A rank hunts make you play each level two or three times should you fail during the story mode. It really sucks too, because if it was just better tuned, I think it would undeniably give Shadow much more meaningful replay value than it currently has. I'm not gonna say absolutely every mission is a cakewalk, I got a few C's and E's here and there. You at least need to pay attention and avoid doing too many things that would subtract your ending rank just not enough to encourage replays. It's frustrating how many things in this game just about miss the mark. I love how fast Shadow can move, but it comes at the cost of making it nearly impossible to steer him. Some of these guns are actually pretty satisfying to use, typically the machine guns that allow you to run and shoot, maintaining your flow. Yet they feel the need to give you rocket launchers and melee weapons that stop you in your tracks when you use them, and serve no practical benefit when the automatic weapons arguably deal more damage faster and more efficiently with the aim assist. I think it looks pretty awesome when Shadow hops on a motorcycle, but then it controls like garbage with no momentum. You can't jump off ramps even when they give them to you, so I almost never jump into these vehicles unless I'm forced to. I think Cosmic Fall showcases this dichotomy quite well. It's the final level of any given pathway, and it's able to effectively set up that Shadow is lost and confused by the information he's gathered thus far. Is he an android? A weapon built for evil? What is he capable of? And should he still exist? This spiraling mental headspace is portrayed beautifully by the arc falling apart around you. The foundations of what Shadow thought to be true are challenged here and now. There are parts of this level which indulge in that fantasy, focusing the camera downward, asking you to jump across platforms spinning out of control, each at a different elevation. It's such a cool concept for a level, and then, randomly, they have segments of the level which force you to stand on a platform for a minute or two, bookended by a poorly localized cutscene where Vector says this to Shadow when he wonders if he should even be alive. I've caused so much destruction. I should never have been created. This is who I am. Hey! Don't go there! Yet! If you could cut out some of the slower segments of the level, I genuinely think it'd be fantastic. It's the same with Black Comet and Final Haunt, which I think look and sound super cool, but go on forever and give you boring enemy hunting missions. Honestly, even Sky Troops, one of my favorite levels in the game, has you jumping in this stupid mech walker and then later forced through this shooting gallery thing. I genuinely think some of these more middling, boring levels could be great if we trimmed some of those edges. But then, I guess it wouldn't be Shadow the Hedgehog without the edge. In keeping with what Sonic Heroes re-established for the character, Shadow continues the hunt for his lost memory. During his search for answers, dangerous aliens invade Earth taunting a connection to Shadow, which prompts a choose-your-own-adventure style progression. Search for answers, protect the planet, doom its inhabitants, or gather the Chaos Emeralds and attain the ultimate power. It's all up to you. This is one of the funniest implementations of a morality system I have ever seen. Now, morality and player choice don't always go hand in hand. 
It's usually a good or evil thermometer, and you make decisions to see what happens and where you end up. It's essentially a bastardized version of classic CRPGs like Fallout and Baldur's Gate, which afforded the player near limitless freedom in how they chose to build their character and interact with the world they were placed in. Of course, when you take that classically rich story structure and simplify it by focusing solely on binary choices and their immediate outcomes, it's not going to feel as satisfying. So here we have Shadow the Hedgehog. He starts the game without his memories, a way to clear the playing field and allow the player to choose his path. Except, it's not actually a blank slate, because fans of the series know what he did in SA2 already, not to mention he had an entire adventure in Heroes where he teamed up with Sonic and saved the world. He must remember doing this, right? This makes the good versus bad dichotomy feel incredibly forced, and a lot of the time, in order to make this work, the game has to rob your choices of their impact. You'd think that by going full hero mode, helping Sonic and his friends, fighting off the Black Arms, and sometimes Eggman, that it would feel like you pointed Shadow back in the direction of SA2 again, reviving the kind-hearted soul we all knew and loved. And yeah, it sorta works out like that, you beat up Black Doom and seemingly stop the Black Comet, but even if you pick every hero option, you're inevitably led to Lost Impact, which will always play the same cutscene where Shadow drops this colorful line. A Chaos Emerald? You've gotta be kidding me, guys. This is like taking candy from a baby, which is fine by me. I can't begin to describe how upset this makes me. Firstly, this mission is in the trenches of the hero pathway, the second to last level of the true hero path, no less. It takes place after you've helped Sonic take out all the Black Arms in Westopolis, after you've helped Sonic take out one of their ships in Black Bull, after you've helped Tails take all the rings back from Eggman, and after you've helped Rouge take out all the Black Arms and beat Black Bull again. You're a bona fide hero. You're doing hero things. You should be a good person, right? Wrong. Shadow, for some reason, sees the Chaos Emerald powering Sonic's ship, and his immediate thought is to not only steal the Emerald, but to mock them for making it so easy. Just a reminder that this plays no matter what as soon as you enter Lost Impact. You can't even enter by ending a stage through the Dark Path, because it's at the bottom of the chart. At most, you can ignore Rouge and Death Ruins, but it still ends with you fighting Black Bull, so no matter what you do, your hero actions lead to Shadow acting like a complete jackass. The premise needs to remain consistent no matter which path you take, and since there are over 300 possible named endings, Shadow needs to maintain an overarching goal. Collect the Chaos Emeralds and uncover his origins. Every ending is consistent with that goal. Since almost every level has a hero and dark route, it means you can swap Shadow's morality on a dime. You can go the true hero path, help all the good guys, do all the good things, drive the Black Arms off the planet, but for whatever reason, Black Doom is still there on the Black Comet expecting you to help them. I know the title of the game is Shadow the Hedgehog, but I really hate how the universe seems to revolve around him. Almost every level has a friend in it who gives you your mission, but what that usually means for those characters is that they lack any agency of their own. They kinda just follow you around and hope you do what they tell you to do, with meaningless quips if you ignore them. Even if you ignore their requests, they'll still help you during the boss fights, and I don't get it. You can ignore Amy in Cryptic Castle, abandoning Cream and Cheese, and she He's still there to help you take down Eggman? Why does Shadow exit cyberspace if you complete the dark mission in Glyphic Canyon? Well, it's because they set certain trigger points for these cutscenes, and the level right above it takes place in cyberspace. Playing through Shadow can't help but feel incredibly disorienting, filled with heel turns that don't make sense, continuity errors, and to top it off, some really bad English localization. Looks like those black creatures are headed out to space. We're on our way to the Ark, so I guess that means we're going too! While we're at it, why does the game about Shadow position Gun as a heroic entity? In this specific context, sure, Gun are the only line of defense against the alien invasion. Without them, the world would be doomed. I get that. But it also means characters like Sonic need to constantly shill for what is essentially the US military, 
positioning them as this morally good force, Gunn was introduced as yet another foolish antagonistic force in SA2. They accidentally lock up Sonic instead of Shadow, putting them on the run while they're trying to stop Eggman at the same time. Meanwhile, we learn that this was the same military that dealt with an innocent child and traumatized Shadow. But I guess Sonic and friends are okay with it because they're friends with the president. Therefore, everything he's involved with must be good, actually. I don't know, it's a big mess. Feels like the story never quite got past its first draft, which actually seems pretty plausible. I'm not a detective, but I have an inkling that Shadow the Hedgehog did not have a lot of dev time. I know, shocker. One of the consequences of that is repetition. You start every route in Westopolis. You play it so many times, you'll be able to quote every spoken line of dialogue, and the music will be stuck in your head for the rest of your life. In order to unlock the last story, you need to finish 10 distinct playthroughs, which essentially means you need to reach the five end levels twice each so you can view their good and bad endings. There's some leeway here to keep those playthroughs fresh, but inevitably, you're going to notice that there are not a lot of levels at the beginning of the game, and you're going to play through those levels an unholy amount of times. I wanted to punch Knuckles in the face the fifth time I entered Glyphic Canyon. I have no idea why they thought it was a good idea to keep introducing characters with several second cutscenes, even if you've already seen them before in previous playthroughs. Hey Shadow, long time no see is a line that spikes my blood pressure a little bit. You know, I actually think Westopolis is a cool level, a fun introduction to your base mechanics, and the missions you'll more or less be following for the rest of the game. I hate it now because of how many times I've been forced to run through it. It's to the point where I can predict the exact moment I'm gonna get chaos powers. This is route dependent, but lord help you if you're on a path that contains Mad Matrix, The Doom, Lost Impact, or Central City. I actually route my playthroughs in such a way that I never set foot in those levels more than once. I don't know what compelled them to make some of these missions last forever. Not even the chaotic stuff was this brutal. Even levels like Final Haunt and Black Comet overstay their welcome, and you're required to go through these levels twice each. I couldn't readily tell you the difference between the two of them. They reuse assets like this all the time. There are two cyberspace levels, three city levels, two comet levels, five arc levels. They even reuse a selection of four unique boss fights. I hope you like Egg Dealer, Black Doom, and Diablon, You'll be fighting them each at least three times with no variations, and you essentially do the same for the mini-bosses. Oh man, homing attacks some slots for a while with basically zero resistance until the fight finally spawns some weapons for you? Brilliant. Glad we did this several times. Oh boy, chase Black Doom around for a while until he's finally finished all his attacks and you can hit him maybe two times before he warps away again. Yes. Aw oh man, a boss arena that only gives you enough ammo to get him down to half HP before you need to sit there, listen to Hold Still, You Devil, 20 times while you homing attack him for 3 minutes, which is actually the intended strategy, because you get an A rank even if 3 minutes have passed, like, what? I think part of the reason every ending feels so limp is that none of these boss fights are exciting or tense or even fun. They're just formalities before you roll credits. It's either they can be killed in 5 seconds or they take 5 minutes, and there's zero in between. Feels like they take up 30% of any given playthrough. I think by the sixth time you enter Westopolis, it's easy to get extremely fed up, because by that point, you probably don't have any new levels left, so here's to five more playthroughs of levels you've already played, and likely all of the horrible missions you skipped over in your earlier playthroughs. I think the worst levels in this game are the open-ended maze levels. Since it uses the Chaotix mission structure, there's a lot more freedom in the way levels can be constructed. Levels like The Doom, Lost Impact, Central City, and Mad Matrix go big, and I really wish they didn't. Pray tell, what do you get in a game that reuses level themes and even geometry, copy-pacing them randomly inside levels that are huge with no set path? You get confused. Mad Matrix is admittedly only horrible when you're doing the dark mission. That said, the dark mission sucks. Huge grid, many intersections, and 40 bombs blow all of them up. The camera makes it almost impossible to see where you're going, so you have to essentially brute force it for 20 to 30 minutes probably looking up a guide somewhere along the way. It's funny, you can spend forever on this mission. They'll still give you the A rank because they knew how bad it was. They were merciful enough to give you some good music to listen to in the meantime, but with the bright lights and samey sights, I wouldn't be surprised if you had a headache by the end of it all. 
Central City looks exactly like Westopolis, except its missions involve you scouring this maze to find bombs. Of course, if they just gave you a map, this would be ten times more tolerable, but they don't. Instead, whenever you turn a corner, you find yourself in a section of the map that looks exactly the same as the one you left. Parts of the level deliberately lead you in circles, and I swear that every section of the city is mirrored so they appear twice just to confuse the hell out of you. And they had the gall to put a timer on you, as if this wasn't frustrating enough to navigate. I don't know whose bright idea it was to make the two arc levels with Maria the worst creations to ever grace mankind. I'd like to have words. These levels could have been so much more. They could have been excellent ways to actually play through Shadow's past, to relive those horrific memories with him. You'd imagine it would be a frantic chase, trying desperately to escape Gun even when you know there's no way out. Instead, it's a giant maze where, for some reason, you end up wandering around for 20 minutes doing mundane tasks. The Doom sees you doing one of several riveting jobs, including healing ten good gun soldiers, finding the goal ring, which even on a good day takes nearly ten minutes of waiting on the slowest elevators known to man, or killing sixty gun soldiers, a mission that is infamously bugged, meaning the last soldier sometimes doesn't even show up until you toggle checkpoints. You're stuck in this enclosed space, literally every room and hallway looks the same, you're forced to slowly carry these explosives with you to break open walls, even though you were able to shoot your way through cracked walls before. Can't even use Chaos Blast to break them, way to make that power feel useless. They play this music that's like... good, I guess, but doesn't even really fit the situation you're in at all. Like, where's the impending doom here? The sorrow? This is supposed to be a painful memory. The gun soldiers literally sit at the top of elevators waiting to knife you. Why is the music so chill? This level is called the doom! And then they did it again? Lost Impact is basically the same, find the exit or kill a ridiculous number of artificial chaos on slow-moving turrets in this winding maze where everything looks the same and they don't give you a map. And of course, they play the sorrowful, downbeat track here when this is the level that's technically less concerned with gun and more concerned with containing the artificial chaos. I'll be honest, it's really hard to love a game this frustrating, knowing that at any moment you can run into one of these levels, or one of these bosses, or one of these cutscenes, it doesn't foster a comfortable environment. There's always this latent anger that threatens to bubble to the surface whenever I boot it up, and it never truly goes away even at the best of times. This is Shadow the Hedgehog, a monotonous, frustrating abomination. In keeping with what Sonic Heroes re-established for the character, Shadow continues the hunt for his lost memory. During his search for answers, dangerous aliens invade Earth, taunting a connection to Shadow, which prompts a choose-your-own-adventure style progression. Search for answers, protect the planet, doom its inhabitants, or gather the Chaos Emeralds and attain the ultimate power. It's all up to you. In creating a game to search Shadow's memories, they make intelligent reuse of pre-existing stage themes that make this world feel a little more real. Shadow gets a flashback on Prison Island, a toxic wasteland after the explosion. Cryptic Castle is probably a reference to Hang Castle. The various arc revisits evoke memories from SA2. Even Sky Troops has an Egg Fleet-esque vibe, I love it. Though there are obviously new stages here, they made the hunt for Shadow's memories much more literal, giving him flashbacks in appropriate places, and missions where he gets to race Sonic again on the arc with shifting gravity. I really appreciate that there was at least an attempt to maintain a coherent world and set of characters once upon a time, like past games and stories really mattered. I also adore how there's a three-faction war going on. Humans versus aliens versus Eggman. Of course Eggman's not gonna sit idly by while the world is brought to ruin by a force other than himself, but he's sure as hell not gonna help the government fight him off. He can't help himself. This might be a controversial take, but I think the Black Arms are a cool villainous presence. That isn't to say I think Black Doom is a good character. They aren't very deep or complex, but the Black Arms as an invasion force serve their role well to leave chaos and mayhem in their wake. Small details like the explosions going off in Westopolis, or the humans and aliens fighting each other throughout the levels, reinforce that this is a dangerous situation. And I don't know, something about seeing Sonic and his friends bright and optimistic through it all reminds me why I love these characters so much. Even when things seem dire, they're not ones to give up lightly. No wonder the president keeps a picture of Sonic and Shadow on his desk. Where would they be without them? 
It's certainly not necessary information that the Black Arms came to Earth 2,000 years ago and left a flying fortress sitting there waiting for their return, or that they assisted Gerald Robotnik in the creation of Shadow, but I don't think it goes against anything we've previously learned either, and they're a fitting enemy force for a Shadow the Hedgehog game. They make for a great devil-on-your-shoulder presence that works really well with the lost memory angle. A Shadow without certain memories, as we saw in SA2, can be a dangerous presence. Even if we know there's good buried inside him, we also know there's anger there, too. He has the capacity to realize what's right and what's wrong, and what he wants to do about it. I think my favorite route is when he travels to the Ark with Sonic and tells the gun commander that if he really was responsible for Maria's death, he'll own up to it and face the music. That is the shadow we all know and love, and I hate that we don't even get a whiff of that these days. I guess this might be a reaction to the current state of Shadow, but seeing a story where you can be the hero in any capacity is just refreshing. Seeing these characters I've loved for so long actively involved, helping Shadow fight off the aliens without forcing five painful jokes into every cutscene, obliterating any and all tension, I don't know, it's nice. I like that I can just spend a bit of time with them again. Helps that I really do like the four kids' voices for these characters. They're probably my favorites. I appreciate the more down-to-earth vibe they're going for, and it would only improve as they all settled into their roles. I think the thing about Shadow for me is that I find myself having fun more often than I'm not. Which might surprise a lot of you, but it's true. You can call it whatever you want. You can say it's my nostalgia, that I have some agenda. It doesn't really change how I feel about it inside. For every boring or frustrating or laughable decision the game makes, there's another that I find genuinely cool, interesting, or honestly just fun. Like, they give Shadow chaos abilities, and that's still incredible to me. You can create a giant explosion, fly through levels, and even stop time during boss fights. Kind of like the Team Blast from Sonic Heroes. Not only that, while your chaos mode of choice is active, you get infinite ammo, meaning you can actually strategically hold these abilities to go rapid fire mode and tear through levels. It's really satisfying. When you're using the rapid fire weapons, it feels like a marriage between the speed and shooting gameplay of previous games with level design that encourages exploration to boot. Not only do they have the usual hidden rooms with ring boxes, extra lives, shields, and in this case, powerful weapons, they also have five keys hidden in every level that unlock secret rooms that usually open up new shortcuts and make revisits more interesting. They don't always lead to something amazing, but they're so well hidden that the encouragement to explore is more than enough for me. And while I know people are going to disagree with me on this, I think there are more good levels than bad among this roster. Westopolis is a fun first level, showcasing the brutality of the Black Arms invasion really well, with a straightforward set of admittedly kinda strict missions that set the tone for the rest of the game quite well. Lethal Highway has a fun idea going on where the road crumbles beneath your feet, forcing you to find new ways forward, or try and beat the explosions, using the ramps to your advantage to make it to the end faster. Shadow might be a bit out of control sometimes, but he still runs just as fast as he always could, utilizing the same physics and momentum that allow you to spin dash jump and carry that momentum to reach greater heights and skip some sections entirely. Digital Circuit's cyberspace theming is rad, and I think it makes cool use of quick decision making on these railways to avoid firewalls and nab ring boxes. Also has some sick music. Circus Park is a fun reprieve where you get to focus more on exploring to collect rings for tails, shooting balloons, jumping through fire hoops, and maintaining higher pathways for the bigger rewards. If you poke around enough, you can even get a lightning shield to make it easier. I always thought that was really cool. And all of these levels more or less hone in on fast-paced platforming. Even the levels that focus more on hunting enemies can be fun if their design promotes that gameplay. I think Gun Fortress is pretty cool. A stronghold deep underground, besieged by the black arms, security turrets you have to sneak your way past. It's ultimately just fun to run and shoot your way through it, no matter the pathway. The Dark Mission gives you the fantasy of mowing through Gun and breaking through their last line of defense, and the Hero Pathway is about taking the high ground, avoiding the waves of Gun troops that you've rightfully pissed off to reach this point, and taking on the aliens you've led to this place. It's a last-minute redemption story that I actually kind of buy, and it feels pretty good no matter the path. The music helps to solidify the path you've taken either way. A groovy track for sure, but one laced with a hint of unease. It 
it's almost as if the game's asking you, did you really lead Shadow here? Is this what the ultimate life form is meant to be? The destroyer of humanity? I think it helps my appreciation of some of these levels that a lot of the music is just so good. It's one of my favorite soundtracks in the whole series. It really fits the tone. Shadow is this confused, angry force of chaotic nature, and what better way to exemplify it than by leaning into the highs and lows of that nature. You're left with some levels that absolutely lean into the rock harder than ever before, with an even darker tinge. Death Ruins is pretty damn heavy. I can't get enough of how the opening riff leads you straight into madness. Lethal Highway opens with a motorcycle revving up before flying straight into a more upbeat track, fitting of the level which follows your first heroic decision. Digital Circuit and Mad Matrix both capture the cyberspace theme perfectly. I wouldn't have it any other way. Some of the catchiest songs in the series. Sky Troops is an obvious highlight, a song which infuses the majesty of these flying ruins alongside the guitar riffs that mark Shadow's exploration of them. It's a certified banger. They hit these notes, but they don't skimp on the slower songs when it really counts. Black Comet and Final Haunt both capture the endgame dungeon in a more somber fashion. It's a surprisingly unique feel for a soundtrack which is frequently derided as having too much butt rock. The Doom might not fit the level super well, but it's a fantastic change of pace, and the fact that I seriously don't mind listening to it for the length of time I spend in that level is saying something. I think Lost Impact captures this mood the best. I can't think of a better song to capture the intensity of this flashback. It's a bittersweet feeling, a look back on a painful memory, but one that's only so painful because of the beauty that was lost to time. And that list just keeps going when you add the incredible vocal themes. I am, all hail shadow, the chosen one, waking up, never turn back. I'm not ashamed to say I listen to these regularly. I don't care what anyone says, this is one of my favorite Sonic soundtracks and you'll never convince me otherwise. I think when Shadow the Hedgehog is firing on all cylinders, it is able to reach the heights of previous games. By far the best ending level and my favorite level in the game is Lava Shelter, the end of the true neutral path, and the absolute best argument for Shadow the Hedgehog's strengths. We'll get the obvious out of the way first. The music is straight fire, one of my favorite stage themes in the series. Do I even need to explain why this rules? However, I don't think the good ends with just the music. I also think this is the most fun stage in the game for a variety of reasons. Firstly, the hero and dark objectives are handled perfectly. The premise of Lava Shelter is that you're hunting down Eggman for answers about who you really are with Omega tagging along as support. I love that Omega's also with you in the previous level, Iron Jungle, if you're on the neutral path, makes it feel like a fitting part two. 
You can either aid Omega, rushing to the end and confronting Eggman as soon as possible, or you can help Eggman set up his defenses to stop Gunn from raiding the base. You might think this is yet another heel turn moment that makes little sense, but when you finish the level, Shadow reframes the mission by implying that he only activates the defenses so that nobody else is able to get to the Doctor except for him. It transforms the hero in Dark Selection into a flavor rather than a dramatic character shifting decision. Not only is this narratively consistent, the missions also change how you play the level itself. It's already a cool one, focused on grinding around really fast with some tricky rail switching segments and some fun platforming over lava. There are also a lot of alternate paths to choose from, which leads us to the dark mission. Should you choose to activate Eggman's defenses, you also raise the lava, and in so doing, completely alter the level design. You're not only cut off from the bottom pathway, you also need to take the top pathway with more caution than you would have before, since there are now instant death lava pits below you. Both of your lava shelter playthroughs will be fundamentally different depending on what kind of person you deem Shadow the Hedgehog to be, and both choices are fun in their own ways. Shadow the Hedgehog, in its brightest moments, puts a smile on my face like all of my other favorite Sonic games. It has incredible music, some triumphant story moments, a decent amount of fun missions, and ultimately, it's just a cool time. Shadow the Hedgehog is a banger. Of course, that isn't the true answer, is it? As always, the truth is complicated. The last story of Shadow the Hedgehog is set up like the previous ones, though it follows the less fulfilling Adventure 1 in Heroes model, where it sorta just happens and there's a final boss. I really don't understand why or how all of the characters are even here, and I think their implementation is pretty lame, all things considered. They fall victim to this paralysis gas that freezes them in place so no one had to animate them doing anything, a gas which Shadow is able to free himself of for whatever reason. The level itself isn't anything special, just another comet level where you rip through enemies and are required to use chaos control every now and then. I don't necessarily have a problem with how the black arms intersects with the story of Professor Gerald, up until the moment it's revealed that the Eclipse Cannon was built to destroy the Black Comet, which just makes the ending of SA2 feel even more bizarre in retrospect. Their existence was never brought up, which makes it clear that this was a soft retcon. At the same time, though, I can't hate what this is ultimately leading to. Shadow going super, fighting Devil Doom to the tune of I Am, Shadow's new badass anthem, throwing out Chaos Spears as he shoots through chunks of debris from the destroyed city. It's not an amazing fight or anything, but it sure captures the fantasy. Watching Shadow beat the hell out of Black Doom, then warp the Black Comet into space using his Chaos Control, blowing it up using the Eclipse Cannon. Look, this last story has issues. Hell, this game has issues. It's held together with sticks and chewing gum, and you can't help but see through the seams at various points. But like, to see Shadow doing heroic things again is really refreshing. It sounds a little sad, and it kinda is, but this was one of the last times Shadow could be considered a hero, someone worthy of the moniker Ultimate Life Form. Through all the wonky dialogue and inconsistent moralizing, there's an undeniable heart hidden somewhere in there. It was a rocky, unfinished road, but I can't help but be a little moved by the final shot. Goodbye forever, Shadow the Hedgehog. To say I hate Shadow the Hedgehog because of the game would be a flat-out lie. Honestly, I think the game is more fun than it isn't. There are certainly some hard low points that test my faith more than the other Sonic games I enjoy. I don't love it or anything, but I think it's a decently fun time spent playing as one of my favorite characters. Yet, it is still true that I hate Shadow the Hedgehog, because whether we like it or not, when Shadow's name is brought up, this game comes with it. For many people, this was the moment where Shadow ceased being a character. This is when Shadow became a meme, a symbol of what was wrong with Sonic in the 2000s, an eternal punching bag second only to the most infamous Sonic game of all time. As much as I have fun playing it, and as much as I really do appreciate the high points, I also can never truly shake the feeling that this is the game that killed 
Shadow the Hedgehog. It killed the lovable rival to Sonic the Hedgehog, the darker yet no less heroic counterpart. And I don't think I'd have a problem with the memes if that didn't go on to inform his perception and character in the future. If he didn't actually turn into a shell of his former self. Nowadays, when Shadow appears, if he ever gets to, he's this angry, mean, borderline evil presence, and it's becoming the accepted norm. We're reaching a point where we'll have seen him depicted this way more than he had ever been a hero. And sure, when you go back to SA2, he was pretty mean for most of it. He was on a revenge mission. He wanted to get back at the humans who had ruined his life and taken away his best friend. But it feels like everyone just glosses over that by the end of the story, he was a fucking hero. He made the sacrifice play and he did it gladly. He focused so much on the ultimate that we forget the life. I love Shadow the Hedgehog. I hate Shadow the Hedgehog. But above all, I really wish he never died. November 14th, 2006. The teacher is telling the class how to do long division. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but then, my mind only has room for one thing at the moment. Once that clock hits 3.30, it'll be time to hop on the bus, run home, and play the new Sonic game for Xbox 360. I'd played Shadow the Hedgehog so many times, the disc wasn't working properly anymore. There were only so many times I could go back to play Adventure, Adventure 2, Heroes, the Advance games. It was finally time for a new, next-gen adventure. As soon as school let out, I raced onto the bus, watched that same old neighborhood pass me by, one stop at a time. Of course, mine was the last, a cruel twist of fate, but eventually, I flew out of that bus, ran inside, said hi to my mom, and locked myself away in my room. It was... beautiful. Everything I could have ever wanted it to be. Yet another action-packed adventure with some of my favorite characters, a main theme I refused to stop listening to, graphics my eyes were simply not used to. It was... a transcendent moment. It's difficult not to get a little wistful, thinking about 2006, back when every new Sonic release was this hype event. In retrospect, that hype didn't always pay off, but it certainly did for me at the time. Sonic was a franchise that would go anywhere and try anything. I always admired that, and it's one of the reasons it was my favorite franchise once upon a time. As my videos have most likely outlined, every one of these games left their mark on me in my formative years, and this game was no different. I wouldn't know it at the time, but 2006 was a turning point for this franchise. Many people see it as rock bottom, yet I choose to see it as the peak. Not because it was some phenomenal game, it was a half-finished mess that is a struggle to play these days, but because it marked the point at which my love for Sonic was at its highest point. Much like Shadow the Hedgehog, my feelings regarding this title are rather complicated. I think at this point, 06 has risen beyond a mere video game. It's an icon of absolute ruin, the de facto worst video game of all time. You don't even have to have played it to call it terrible. And in fact, I'd hazard a guess that most Sonic fans today haven't, given that it's never been officially re-released. And so it stands, the game which still has an iron grip on all of us. No one can forget 06, not even the franchise itself. We aren't allowed to. For better or worse, Sonic 06 defines this franchise. Much like Solaris, it inhabits Sonic's past, present, and likely his future, the universal constant. I am, frankly, sick to death of the power this game has over Sonic discourse. I would love nothing more than for this 16-year-old video game to be laid to rest. Though I don't think myself arrogant enough to achieve this, I'm certainly going to try. Today we challenge Sonic 06, the past which made it infamous, the present which morphed it into an icon, and the uncertain future that lay before us. This is Sonic the Hedgehog. Let's travel back to 2006 and discuss the reasons why I played this game for days on end. Sonic 06 was an ambitious game. A lot of people call it Adventure 3, and it's not hard to see why. It inherits the approach of both adventure games. The intersecting character stories, the epic god monsters, the hub worlds, the classic-esque level design, 
I think there's a marriage of both approaches here that makes for a compelling structure. The stars of the show are Sonic, Shadow, and Silver, who each have two Amigo characters that show up for a minute at most in some of their levels and play more traditionally. This allows everyone to be playable without creating nine different stories. I always wondered how Tails could work in a 3D Sonic game without inevitably becoming really boring, and it turns out the solution to that was to not make him a main playable character. It's much easier to get past the idea that Tails can't do a whole lot when you only play as him in a short segment during Wave Ocean, White Acropolis, and Aquatic Base. Tails can still play a role in the story without distracting too much from the stars of the show. Sonic is still focused mainly on speedy platforming. Occasionally you'll homing attack or bounce on some robots, but for the most part, you'll be light dashing through ring trails, grinding on the wind, running up walls, and blasting through mock speed segments. The levels you run through strike a great balance between the two adventure games. Kingdom Valley opens with quite a lot of freedom. You can run or grind down the winding bridges, or bounce up to homing attack this eagle for a shortcut. From there, you have so many potential options. Destroy the bridge with a homing attack to open up the way to a set of springs to reach the top pathway. You could also dash straight through, hop onto the eagle, and take the lower pathway. Or you can bounce on this rope multiple times to jump onto this bridge without breaking it, riding the top pathway near instantly. If you take the top path, you're given another selection during a wall running segment very similar to this section in Speed Highway. Maintain the wall run onto the upper pathway and make it to the end of the segment faster, or take the lower path for the scenic route. This is just the first segment of the level, the first act, if you will, because 06 takes after the first adventure in another way, with seamless transitions to different acts of a zone. You're transported to a segment of the castle closer to the water, and tag off to Silver, letting him carve a path through this more treacherous segment. It's a bit slower, the music slows down too, you're more focused on platforming here. After this quick excursion, you're taken to the next area, where the music picks up the pace, and the level design adopts a more linear, speed-focused approach not unlike SA2, ending with a mock speed segment where you run on walls of water in an effort to catch up to Eggman once and for all. Probably one of the coolest sections in any of these games, by the way. Sonic's level design feels like the culmination of everything they'd been building in 3D, and you see this evolution dotted throughout the playthrough. White Acropolis has a snowboard segment which bridges into a more linear section, broken up by the Tails area, and ending with this big sandbox you have to make your way through. Crisis City also begins with a boarding segment, except it's through a ruined city on the sides of fallen buildings. It has a similar structure to Kingdom Valley too, transitioning into a segment with multiple pathways, then one more focused on platforming inside a cyclone, finally ending with a mock speed segment as you attempt to escape the fire tornado. Even levels where you're carrying Elise don't skimp on alternate pathway selections and cool platforming, though they might be shorter than most. In terms of design and layout, they're all fantastic. Shadow's distinction comes with his sheer power. He can shoot out Chaos Spears, he sits in the air and flails around after a homing attack, and he can even pull out his Chaos Blast once you kill enough enemies. His meter system makes it really fun to rack up combos. The higher it gets, the quicker Shadow will rip through them all. His homing attack turns into a warp, and his Chaos Spears will start doing damage. Of course, each level still has its share of pathways, but Shadow is a lot more about linear platforming with several enemies to defeat in sequence. As I said in my Shadow video, I think it makes sense to focus on his destructive power to set him apart from Sonic. Watching him shred through enemies is extremely satisfying. You even get to do it on vehicles that control much better than the ones in Shadow and are generally more useful. Like Adventure 1, Shadow goes through the same levels as Sonic, but the design has been altered. He'll go through Sonic sections of Kingdom Valley, but the first one will be on a hang glider, the second controlled by Rouge searching for keys, into a hover vehicle section over water, ending with Sonic's linear set piece filled section, except Shadow goes through it backwards to make it feel more fresh. There are always minor adjustments like this, playing as Rouge or Omega instead of other characters, not carrying Princess Elise, using a vehicle in lieu of a mock speed section, or even traversing entirely new areas that Sonic never sees in Crisis City and Dusty Desert. What's great, though, is that the increased focus on combat doesn't take away from exploring for life or ring boxes, and the levels still often have meaningful upper pathways to exploit to get through them quicker. It might not embody the blindingly fast speed of Sonic, but it does embody the powerful cool factor of Shadow the Hedgehog. 
Silver is an odd one. His power, Psychokinesis, was likely inspired by the new physics engine they were working with. You can lift objects or enemies into the air and throw them as if they were projectiles. It also allows you to hover over gaps. This is fairly non-traditional Sonic gameplay centered around gathering up a bunch of objects and destroying foes with powerful psychic blasts. But if you've been watching me for a while, I'm not someone who's a stickler for what Sonic should or should not be, as long as it's fun. And I think, despite not really resembling what most people would assume Sonic gameplay to be, Silver's gameplay is satisfying in its own way. The levels are still focused on exploring and finding alternate pathways, you just don't use the same tools to find those things. Instead, you use objects like boxes or cars to float high into the air and skip sections, or you use your glide to reach rainbow rings or far off platforms with ring boxes and lives awaiting you. These levels are about the most efficient way to get from point A to B using Silver's skill set. He might be slower than the other two hedgehogs, but his psychic powers set him apart and emphasize the platforming side of Sonic more than any of the 3D games really have up to this point. It's a bit hard to describe, but stockpiling enemies' boxes and spike balls, throwing them into a cabal of enemies, and watching everything blow up in front of you is really addicting. I think most Sonic games benefit from outstanding sound design. When I was a kid, I enjoyed the simple act of homing attacking gun robots in SA2 because the sound and visual effects effect that ensued made me feel super powerful. And that's part of the reason I enjoy the combat of 06 so much. Not only does every character go about their combat differently, Tails can drop ring boxes while he's flying, Omega can shoot from a distance similar to Gamma, Knuckles can drill dive smash into large groups, but every single character has the benefit of this incredible explosive sound, paired with the physics system making them fly around all over the place. If the audio-visual experience was any different, I don't think Silver would be nearly this satisfying to play. Including Blaze in his story is really cool too. She plays a lot like Sonic, with maybe the best best homing attack, making it really fun to fly through her playable areas. Despite them all visiting the same levels, the three stories feel entirely unique, and I really appreciate that they were able to strike a balance between the level design and structure of the adventure games, but also incorporate the combat elements from Heroes and Shadow. The story is more reminiscent of the adventure games. Adventure 2 really streamlined the story setup, but it also resulted in a story with a much smaller scope. Most of the concepts in the last story had to be explained during the last story, since the foundation of the base story was just another bout between Sonic and Eggman. Recently, I tried out a mod that puts both of the stories together in chronological order, and it showed me that both approaches worked in their own ways, which could certainly not be said about Adventure 1. However, it also calls into question whether SA2 really got the most out of this structure, or if it worked in spite of it. In 06, each story is unique. Sonic's story is focused on Eggman and Elise, Shadow's is focused on Mephilus, and Silver's is focused on Iblis. You could tell this story in chronological order, but I think it would be worse for it. Part of that is because of the reused stages, sure, but even if every character had entirely new stages, the story itself would feel really chaotic if it was told all at once. Sonic's story, as ever, is about the thrill of the adventure. He presumably comes to Soliana, the city of water, to take in the sights and sounds, meet the locals, however a free spirit like him wants to spend his time. I like to think he was simply there to watch the fireworks before Eggman showed up to crash the party. Eggman feels like a genuine threat here. I'm incredibly sick of his more modern interpretations, representing him as completely incompetent. Rather than making him out to be an idiot, the focus is on his more sinister elements, while not skimping on the goofier elements of his character when appropriate. I always get a laugh out of his ejection from the Egg Wyvern. Ostensibly, this is yet another tale of Sonic vs. Eggman, with the shake-up being that he has to save a princess and teach her about living in the moment and taking charge of her life. Yeah, it's a bit cliché at this point, but Sonic also isn't a particularly complicated character. He knows what he wants out of life, and I think his stories are the most fulfilling when he's able to inspire others to live theirs, while removing any obstacles in the way of his fun. It's a story that's able to noticeably affect Sonic. His failure to save Elise in Kingdom Valley will always stick with me. It's humbling to know even he isn't immune to sorrow or despair. Yet, it's his ability to constantly rise above that, to find another way forward, that I've always admired about him. And it makes his seventh Eggman thrashing all the sweeter. He's a character that lives for the now, a paragon of the present.
I always thought Silver's story was really cool, a telekinetic hedgehog from a ruined future who travels back in time to save it. Already a compelling hook, his naivete, while occasionally frustrating, is also very understandable. He lives in a post-apocalyptic future. Iblis is all he's ever known, so when another intelligent life form shows up claiming to know how to solve everything, Silver has no reason not to trust him. He's not had a life which would have introduced him to concepts like deceit or manipulation. He takes everything at face value, but that's also what I love about him. It's genuinely heartwarming to see him take in the beauty of the past, appreciating the finer things, interacting with the locals, and I think it's awesome that Amy plays a role in his story, making him question whether killing someone to save the future is the right thing to do. After he learns about the true origins of Iblis, he goes back to the future to seal him once and for all, content to simply rebuild what he's lost rather than take away the happiness of others. He achieves true acceptance of the future. Shadow's story is probably one of his strongest showings. He finds himself infiltrating Eggman's base in White Acropolis as an agent of Gun, sent to rescue Rouge. She was on a mission to retrieve the Scepter of Darkness. It's broken in Kingdom Valley, unleashing a fragment of Solaris who goes by the name Mephilus. This story is about tracking Mephilus down and defeating him with the help of Rouge and Omega, a classic Team Dark adventure. Mephilus works really well as a foil, a literal and metaphorical shadow a manipulative force tempting him to his side. We don't know much about the research project conducted by the Duke of Soliana, but given the outcome, one would assume that Solaris did not appreciate what they were doing to it. If I had to guess, they were either fearful of its power and wanted to destroy it, or they simply wanted to claim dominion over it. I mean, it's not like we haven't seen that exact same desire with Chaos and Professor Gerald. Mephilus has reason to be pretty pissed off at the humans, and I think it was smart to connect that part of him to Shadow, a character with his own rocky relationship with humanity. He gives Shadow a glimpse of the future, a window into their fear of him. Not only will humanity betray him once more, they're going to use Omega to do it. Despite this, Shadow does not waver. His promise to Maria is ironclad. Whether they appreciate it or not, he will ensure that they'll be given a chance to be happy. Scenes like this make me question why people view Shadow as an anti-hero. An anti-hero is an atypical hero who is often depicted as immoral, selfish, and otherwise non-ideal. They fight for a good cause, but not usually for a good reason, unless that good reason somehow benefits them. Alternatively, they might fight for a selfless cause, but using methods which would be considered immoral or brutal. My mind usually gravitates to someone like the Punisher, who is willing to do whatever it takes to stomp out evil at its source. Now, I think people's idea of an anti-hero is much different from my own, Considering that when I Google the term, the first result is Batman, which uh, it seems pretty wrong to me. Batman is a hero. He fights for justice to save his city from a gang of scary villains, often to the detriment of himself or those around him. His role is self-sacrificial. He loses so much to protect Gotham that it's often a source of drama and conflict with his found family. Shadow, meanwhile, falls into the same camp. He works for Gun, the organization that killed his best friend, to safeguard the future of humanity. Most people would never do something like this, and an anti-hero certainly wouldn't. Shadow could very easily strike out on his own and do whatever the hell he wants to. He's the ultimate life form, and that's the kicker. He works for Gun anyway. He's willing to work with the Gun commander and the president to conquer the past and forge a better future for the betterment of all mankind. As he says, should humanity turn against him, he will fight like he always has, to forge his own destiny and do what he believes is right, with a moral compass instilled in him by Maria. The reason I love this moment isn't because he's a Deadpool-esque figure doing whatever he wants, it's because even when the whole world turns on him, he won't give up fighting to make the world better for them, because he believes in the inherent good of human nature. That was what Maria taught him. This is who Shadow was always meant to be, a bona fide hero who always puts the past behind him. If the world chooses to become my enemy, I will fight like I always have.
It's important to note that the supporting cast do play a pivotal role in making these stories feel as complete as they do. Blaze's sacrifice at the end of Silver's playthrough is why it packs so much of a punch. Rouge's remark to Shadow that she'll always be by his side even if the world turns against him solidifies Team Dark as my favorite trio. And though Tails and Knuckles play a fairly minor role in the story overall, Having them be there to help Sonic through Aquatic Base is the cherry on top. You get a satisfying plot no matter which story you pick, with yet another last story that brings it all together, traveling to various levels throughout space and time as Solaris enacts the literal end of the world. It feels like a more fleshed out realization of Adventure 1's endgame, where you play as everyone to collect the scattered emeralds, ending with the three titular hedgehogs going super to fight Solaris in the past, present, and future to the tune of an orchestral redux of his world. There's a finality to 06 that feels fitting. Everyone forgets what happened after Elise blows out the flame sustaining Solaris, with a cheeky hint that perhaps the lingering feelings still remain. A bittersweet note to end a game this climactic. When I tell people that I was able to play this game dozens of times as a kid, these were the reasons why. I wasn't able to articulate those reasons when I was 10 years old. I probably would have just said it was a fun platformer featuring some of my favorite characters of all time, and that is true, but I think even at the time, I was able to recognize and appreciate how ambitious it all was. Ironically, the game which broke many people's faith in Sonic the Hedgehog is the one which forged my ironclad faith in it. I couldn't stop replaying this game, listening to one of the best soundtracks in all of gaming, re-watching the gorgeous CG cutscenes, screwing around in the hub worlds, hunting for S-ranks, breaking the game with Sonic's gems. I don't have the raw numbers anymore since our old 360 red ringed, but I'm quite sure 06 is somewhere in my top 5 most played Sonic games of all time. At that time in my life, my love for Sonic the Hedgehog had never been greater. Of course, the older you get, the less mysterious life becomes. Development for 06 began in late 2004, meaning Sonic Team had two years to develop a next-gen blockbuster for two systems that weren't even out yet. Not only that, somewhere along the way, they realized the Wii wouldn't be powerful enough to run the game, and Sega's solution was to cut the team in half and have them work on a Wii version that would eventually turn into its own title. Project lead Yuji Naka would leave Sonic Team during this, and Sega would not budge on their Holiday 15th anniversary release. I'm sure this is stuff you've all heard before, but I want to explain it again because it feels like there's not nearly enough emphasis placed on just how much of a miracle 06 is. Not only was it rushed, the project lead left mid-development, and half of its staff were axed to go work on something else. And their original goal was to make something with the same cultural impact as Spider-Man 2 and Batman Begins. I really want to live in a world where 06 was given a few more years and secret rings never came to be. Who knows where we might be now? As I've grown older, the blemishes that resulted from this half-finished video game have become ever more apparent. Everything I talked about I still admire today. It's just that playing Sonic 06 is an entirely different beast. Again, I'm sure you've heard this before. Nevertheless, I'm gonna run through its laundry list of issues to drive this point home. Every single character controls like garbage to greater or lesser extents. Sonic, Shadow, and Blaze kinda work, more or less. They each have a lot of moves and run relatively fast. They still have issues like coming to a dead stop after a homing attack, or not being able to damage enemies by jumping on them, or not being able to jump out of a spin dash. Shadow can't even spin dash. When running on walls, Sonic will occasionally clip something and fall off. Shadow has a really hard time getting his punches and kicks to connect with enemies after a homing attack, so he often just flails around in the air doing nothing. His vehicles, which are usually required might control better than in his own game, but that's still not saying much. 
If you so much as hit a bump in the road, not only will your vehicle take damage, it'll also probably flip over. Shadow's Radical Train is infuriating because of stuff like this, and that's not even mentioning his dusty desert with this godforsaken hovercraft. Sonic can't move while he bounces, all characters lose momentum while in the air, Sonic will stumble if he hits a wall or object at high speed, and those problems become even worse in Mach Speed. It's incredibly easy to take a hit since maneuvering Sonic is next to impossible, you can stunlock yourself into death if you aren't careful, Sonic can't move while jumping, and there are a few segments that completely break if you don't approach them in the exact, correct way. Basically, they control like shit, and they're the best characters on offer. Silver, Tails, and Omega are a step down. Silver's abilities are kinda broken, and not in the fun way. If you pick up too many objects, they'll usually just collide with each other when thrown. Very fun during certain boss fights. He can't reliably stun enemies with his pimp slap unless you're a pixel away from them. To counterbalance his abilities, he moves super slowly, meaning his levels take a very long time to complete. Since so many of his combat options involve him slowly walking around or standing in place for a long time, you take damage constantly for pretty much no reason. Omega in theory controls like Gamma, but when he locks onto enemies, he has to stop wherever he is to shoot them, and it only does one homing attack worth of damage. You can run up and shotgun blast them, but it does pitiful damage and you have to get so close that you'll take damage immediately. Really, the best option for Omega is to hover from a distance and shoot energy blasts until everything dies. Tails controls like he did in SA1, but he's a lot slower and his flight doesn't last nearly as long. The problem is that since you no longer hurt enemies by curling into a ball, Tails has to throw dummy ring boxes, sort of like he could in Heroes. You can either very slowly and painfully throw them from the ground, or rapid fire them while flying. Except, while flying and shooting is the obvious choice here, it's also really hard to hit anything precisely when you're doing this. But I'd still take these characters over... Knuckles, Rouge, and Amy. Knuckles and Rouge have the infamous wall glitch where they get stuck to a wall and can't jump off, but they're also saddled with other fun quirks, like their attacks being next to worthless. Knuckles has his punch combo again, but it has essentially no range, and more often than not, you'll just get hit while you're doing it. His drill dive is laughably bad, since it doesn't go straight down anymore. It follows an arc and cannot deviate from that arc. So if you drill dive over a platform, usually this will happen. Rouge can't kick anymore. Even though I thought the point of her character was to contrast Knuckles by using her legs instead of her hands, but oh well. She's a secret agent, so you have to throw bombs. This is similar to Tails, except even worse, since she also stops to throw them while you're in the air. Thankfully, neither of these characters really need to fight enemies in their short sections. Amy, on the other hand? She's the slowest character of them all, her hammer attack is the slowest thing known to man, and locks her in place for several seconds. She can inexplicably turn invisible, which is nearly useless, and she has a double jump which completely cancels any and all momentum she may have had. Screw the ball puzzle, Amy is clearly the worst part of Silver's Dusty Desert. As you can imagine, it's really hard to appreciate the care put into the level design when the controls you use to navigate them are so god-awful. It's actually pretty Pretty tragic when you peruse the cutting room floor to see what this game could have been. Super Sonic was supposed to be playable in the levels. You might imagine they could have done something with Shadow and Silver too if they had more time. There are entire moves missing for various characters, Sonic's missing his Misty Flip that he could do in the adventure games, I'm sure you could even imagine a universe where the game's loading wasn't so abysmal. It might not sound like I've really gone over a lot, but Control is basically one half of the platforming experience here, and I'd argue it barely functions. This isn't didn't like the previous 3D Sonic games, which had little bugs or quirks that would pop up from time to time. When you enter a level in 06, you will run into something that will upset you multiple times, guaranteed. Though I really respect what the story was going for, it is also very clear to me that it was the only draft written for it. People like to prod at Sonic Adventure 2 for having weird moments, like Tails creating a fake Chaos Emerald out of nowhere, and I agree that its story was never perfect. 
but I think when you compare it to 06, it's clear that it at least reached its final draft. Time travel is a tricky mistress for most stories, and this one is no different. There are a lot of really cool ideas here, like Shadow meeting Mephilus in the present after Mephilus had already met Shadow in the past, or Omega showing up in the future to help Shadow fight Mephilus by going into stasis for many years. Squad goals, for sure. But it means that when Omega travels back to the present with everyone, two Omegas now exist. It also means that Shadow had to exist in the past to meet Mephilus, so this is fine, right? As long as we abide by the logic that you can't change the past. Except, you can change the past, since Sonic does it to save Elise from dying. Because he can do this with basically no consequences, it kinda makes me wonder why Shadow and Silver don't try to just travel a little further back in time to stop the Soliana experiments from taking place. They clearly have no qualms about changing the future, or at least Silver doesn't. It's also pretty insane that all you have to do in order to time travel is use Chaos Control on two Chaos Emeralds. What was happening in Sonic CD, anyway? As we see at the end of the game, Elise blows out the flame of Solaris, resetting everything that happens. It's kind of a clusterfuck. I suppose you could just say, it's time travel, deal with it. The good old Kingdom Hearts approach. But that isn't even the end of the weird stuff in this story. I really like Mephilus, but the actions he takes are questionable. His goal is to make Elise cry, thus awakening Iblis. You'd think he could just kill her. <laughs> Would that not also release Iblis? But even if we take it at face value, that she needs to cry for Iblis to be released, Mephilus is also someone that can time travel at will and has literally no problem interacting with the world around him. Yet, he chooses to manipulate Silver into killing Sonic for him. Then, when Silver doesn't do it, he just kills Sonic anyway! The only explanation for this is that Mephilus is sadistic and specifically wants to make both Elise and Silver suffer, but it just feels like a fairly weak motivation, especially since the people who conducted the experiments are long dead by this point. I don't hate the idea of Elise, but I think they pushed her a little too far into the realm of romance, when all they really had to do was make Sonic into an inspirational figure for her. As I said in my adventure video, I'm not a big fan of humans existing in the Sonic universe, but since they already pulled that trigger, I'm fine with them continuing the trend. But I think there are ways to pull this off that aren't quite this disturbingly realistic. I don't necessarily have a problem with more realistic environments, even though there were a few more abstract environments in the classic games, by the time we reached Sonic 3 there were more realistic locations than ever before. Angel Island, Sandopolis, Ice Cap, Lava Reef, there were even a lot of man-made locations like Flying Battery and the Death Egg. I never got the sense that Sonic has ever abandoned the more surreal aspects of its levels, especially since we got heroes in the middle of all this. I just wish they were able to find a blend that worked better than this, because it's one of the only games in the series where Sonic and friends look genuinely out of place in most scenes. And Eggman just... <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't really work here. The pacing of the story is honestly quite boring, with characters standing around and doing exposition most of the time. It's clear that the voice actors were given one or two takes at most, and the line reads clash heavily with the poorly mo-capped cutscenes. Sonic doesn't get a lot of moments to show off the more cocky, impatient parts of his personality, and Jason's already subdued performance probably doesn't help matters there. He became my favorite voice for Sonic at the end of his tenure, but his early days were a bit rough. He fits Shadow much better. Unfortunately, Silver's voice is probably the reason everyone hated him so much. He's supposed to be naive, sure, but every single sentence that comes out of his mouth makes him seem like a whiny child. Then tell me what we should do. How can we completely destroy Iblis? For the future of the world, I will destroy you! Don't you dare turn your back on me! You're my friend, right? The coolest parts of these stories are always at the very beginning and the very end. There's so much fluff in between, which isn't helped by the random town missions you have to do for seemingly no reason. Why does Sonic have to choose which woman he loves more before he can enter Kingdom Valley? Who set up these trials anyway? These dipshits are the reason Sonic can't reach Elise in time and she dies! 
It's funny, some of these town missions come out of nowhere. Like, sometimes you'll be watching a cutscene, and as soon as it ends, you're immediately thrust into a mission to escort some girl. Unfortunately, the town missions are the only worthwhile thing to do in these hub worlds. Upgrades are bought at the shop, so you can't explore for them like you could in SA1, and their layouts are a lot more barren. To top it all off, there are, in fact, many, many, many glitches to encounter. And here's where I thought we were all in agreement, right? Sonic 06 shot for the stars and fell terribly short because of its infamously poor development cycle. Had things been different, we might have had a much, much better game on our hands. But then, I remembered something. There is a subset of people out there who had a bone to pick with Sonic ever since he took his first steps into the third dimension. People who consider Adventure, Adventure 2, Heroes, and especially Shadow the Hedgehog to be abominations and a stain on the franchise's legacy. So of course, Sonic 06 would be shown no quarter. And given how bad it already was, I think it was far easier for the general public to start agreeing with those sentiments. See, before, I think it's safe to say that the general discontent towards 3D Sonic was headed up by very hardcore Sonic fans, the type that would spend most of their free time browsing Sonic Retro or some other forum. This is pretty much just par for the course of any fanbase, a minority of a minority lurk on the forums. Critical reception for the adventure games was extremely positive, and even Heroes got a pretty decent rating for a game that was most certainly not finished. There was still a feeling amongst critics that the 3D entries weren't quite as stellar as the 2D ones, but those remarks didn't come without praise. Not to mention, 3D was this new and uncharted frontier, and basically none of these games, not even the legendary Mario 64 or Ocarina of Time, would be able to hold a candle to their much more refined 2D entries in the eyes of fans. Basically, every single franchise had growing pains around this time, and Sonic was no different. It reviewed well, sold remarkably well on what was at the time a dead console, and continued to sell well when ported to GameCube. I mean, in terms of high-speed 3D action stories, there wasn't a lot else like it at the time. Yet, they were never going to be as polished or proven as the 2D titles. With each release, that dissatisfied elite grew louder and louder, as Sega lost its share in the console market, went multi-platform, and was clearly going through its own financial struggles. 3D development would become more and more expensive as the industry marched forward with more powerful hardware. Development time would balloon, and so would its cost. And yet Sega tried to maintain its blindingly fast output. Heroes was clearly compromised, Shadow even more so, and 06 was the boiling point. We found ourselves in the fan-dubbed Dark Age of Sonic. So while yes, Sonic 06 was an unfinished mess, it simultaneously became the franchise's laughingstock. As the years went by, people would poke fun at the glitches and weird quirks, but every now and then, someone would make comments about how weird it is that there's a love story between Sonic and Elise. Someone would comment about how dumb it is that there's a huge time travel plot. Someone would rant about how awful the voice acting was. Someone would throw this story through the CinemaSins machine. Someone would inevitably say, this isn't what Sonic should be. Somewhere along the way, Sonic 06 was no longer the tragedy of a development team brutally mismanaged by its parent company. It had become a project that was doomed from its very inception. Whether anyone knew it or not, a firm line in the sand had been drawn here and now, much more firmly than it had ever been. After all, what better place than rock bottom to finally argue about what brought us here? So, when we look at Sonic 06, what are the root causes of these issues? Is it that the nine playable characters are broken? Or is it that there are nine playable characters? Is it that you can poke a million holes through this story? Or is it the fact that there was such an ambitious story to begin with? Is it that the voice actors were given very little direction or time? Or was it that these characters even have voices to begin with? Was this the most high-profile disaster the industry has ever seen? Or was it the stupidest idea to ever grace the franchise? Sonic 06 has transcended video game status. Now it's this ultimate icon of failure. 
one that most people have heard about and even fewer have actually played. Since it's been stuck on 360 and PS3 since it was released, people consume this game through Let's Plays, absorbing the opinions of the entertainers who play up their reactions to it, they consume it through the opinion of their favorite content creators, and they then spread that opinion to their friends, who spread it to their friends, and before long, Sonic 06 is the boogeyman of the industry, this mythical disaster that every subsequent release will be compared to. Hell, the franchise itself has begun poking fun at the game through its social media team. It's the cool thing to do. Naturally, this affected the trajectory of the franchise and its games. Sonic Unleashed came out, and what was the response? Oh no, Sonic turns into a werehog now. That's stupid. Never mind that it shot Sonic into higher speeds than ever thought possible. Never mind that it had a heartwarming, globe-trotting adventure story. Never mind that the humans were stylized to fit in better with Sonic and pals. Never mind that this was the game where we finally got to see and play through Eggman Land. Nope, none of it matters because Sonic turns into a werehog and that's not Sonic. Scrap it all. Regardless of your feelings on Unleashed, it's clear to me that Sonic Team poured their hearts and souls into it, and for it to be met with middling critical reception and overwhelming cries for Sonic to basically stop trying, it's no wonder that every new game stripped away a part of his identity. Sonic Colors took away the scope and basically stopped trying to do anything too exciting. An extremely lighthearted story with awful jokes centered around saving colorful aliens from a maniacal doctor. It was nothing too egregious, I don't need every Sonic game to be some big epic showdown with world-ending stakes. After all, I like Sonic Heroes. Curiously, Sonic Generations, a celebration of the series' history, has basically no story at all. And as excellent as that game was, it's hard not to see that as a strange move given that story had a pretty important role in making these games so special as far back as Sonic 3. We don't get to see any of the myriad characters brought back to do much of anything, except sit around and wait to be rescued. There's so much missed potential here. Generations was awesome, but can you imagine a Generations with a proper story? But no, we had already decided by that point that Sonic's friends were very stupid and should not be playable, even though the series had established a pattern of introducing a new playable character for every single game since Sonic 2. Bit by bit, the things I always admired about Sonic from the beginning, his willingness to challenge conventions and try to stick out in his own way, had completely vanished in favor of shamelessly ripping off other franchises and pandering to fan nostalgia in every single game to ever release. And no matter how bad things get, no matter how clearly rushed the games are, no matter how derivative they are, no matter how much they shove Green Hill in our faces, even when they poured everything they had into a reboot initiative that crashed and burned almost immediately, the overwhelming sentiment was, well, at least it's not Sonic 06. Sonic has always meant a lot to me, and I think most would probably wonder why that is. I mean, Sonic? Really? There are so many other, better games out there to play. I had always resisted that. People might make fun of me for saying that Sonic Adventure 2 is one of my favorite video games, but I think it truly deserves that spot. It's by no means a perfect game. But I don't judge art mathematically. Some of my favorite games are as close to perfect as you can get, and some of them are barely held together. What ultimately matters to me is a game's spirit. How did its various elements come together to craft something unforgettable? Despite some of the things I used to say in my videos, I'm not someone who only cares about the gameplay or whatever. I care about how it all comes together. Sonic Adventure 2 isn't one of my favorite games because it's the most fun video game I've ever played. I mean, it is really fun. But there's more to it than that. The fast-paced, high-stakes story adds a lot to the levels you play through. The music gets my blood pumping, and ultimately I love the characters enough that I want to play through a bunch of levels with them. A really fun game is great and all, but it adds so much more to the overall experience when that gameplay is enhanced by everything else. And that's why I used to love Sonic. 
It was a franchise that was firing on all cylinders. It wasn't content to just make a fun game. It strove to make something really cool. It didn't always meet that goal, and even I'll admit, sometimes Sonic Team found themselves in situations where they bit off more than they could chew. They had a few ideas I didn't always agree with. There were some unfortunate setbacks, but none of that really mattered to me because at the end of the day, Sonic gave me something I couldn't readily get elsewhere. Now? Well, what Sonic currently provides I can very easily get elsewhere. While the rest of the fanbase gets sucked into Sonic Frontiers, I'm over here waiting for the Xenoblade 3 DLC to release because it's a franchise I care so much more about. My only love for Sonic these days is entirely focused on fan projects. Sonic Mania, Sonic Triple Trouble, and Project 06. I have a question for the people who believe that Sonic 06 was fundamentally flawed. Have you played Project 06? I'm sure you've heard about it, but have you actually witnessed it for yourself? Because I have, and it's amazing. As we've already established, 06 has incredible level design, so all you need to do is make the characters fun to control. Sonic controls like he did in the adventure games. You can spam the spin dash and jump out of it. You also maintain your momentum while jumping, meaning you can use it to reach higher areas again. Homing attacks are faster and maintain your momentum. You can move while bouncing, the light dash is mapped to a separate button, wall running is basically flawless, mock speed sections are actually some of my favorite parts of the game now that you can control yourself in midair and can't death lock yourself. All that really happened here was a few tweaks to the way Sonic controls, and you can see in this footage just how much it improves the flow of the game. Shadow's attacks are faster and more powerful than they've ever been. It feels so good to mow through enemies and build your chaos meter. But now he has a spin dash! Vehicles have been fixed, but now that you have the spin dash, you often don't even need to use the vehicles anyway. When you're forced into them, you actually get to see what they were supposed to do, like how the hovercraft can maintain speed while in the air. Shadow's flame core is some of the most fun I've ever had in a Sonic game. Teleporting through enemies, trying desperately to keep your meter filled up. If you go beyond level 3 after unlocking the inhibitor rings mode, yeah, you heard that right. Shadow can take off his inhibitor rings to enter a super-esque state where he's at his most powerful. It's even more fun to chain since when you run out, Shadow gets stunned and you have to wait a few seconds. Trying to find the most optimal time to take these off to fly through enemies and make it through the level as fast as possible is absolute peak Shadow gameplay. It's the same with Sonic's Super Transformation, which has a mid-air dash that can skip sections entirely if you use it right. At the time of writing, Silver doesn't have his campaign released yet, but in his brief playable segments during Sonic and Shadow's stories, the changes made to him are already incredible. He moves much faster now, with a floating animation for his top speed. His glide takes him much farther, and his dash move is way more useful, especially for taking shortcuts. His stun range has been increased, and the objects he throws are less prone to breaking mid-flight. He's also been given a set of projectiles to fight enemies with should he lack objects from the environment. It doesn't sound like a lot, but P06 Silver and regular 06 Silver are like night and day, and I'm very excited to see his eventual story release. Not only will his levels be much more fun, the segments where you play as Blaze and Amy will no doubt be amazing, since the Amigos have also been fixed. Tails is overall a lot faster, so his sections are more fun to get through, but he also benefits from a change to the overall game where you can damage enemies by curling into a ball again. However, he also has his twirl from Sonic Adventure and a tail swipe move in midair. You can actually tail swipe onto enemies to stay in the air without expending his flight meter. It's super fun trying to extend your flight time by pulling this off. Knuckles and Rouge both benefit from better combat options and less glitchy abilities. Rouge can kick again, hallelujah. And hey, the levels where she hunts for keys have been altered to more closely resemble their adventure counterparts, where now the keys are randomly generated again, and you even have a radar you can use to find them, making Tropical Jungle in particular much more dynamic than it was in the original, where you sorta of just flew over to the gold ring. Omega can go into first-person turret mode to gun down his enemies, 
His overall moveset is still a bit weak, but I hear there are some exciting changes to his moveset coming down the pipeline which put him more in line with his hero's playstyle, and you cannot imagine how hyped I am for that. There are so many small touches too. Silver actually shows up to fight the robots for Sonic in Kingdom Valley, Sonic telling Shadow not to be late occurs in a short cutscene before Crisis City starts, Silver flies up next to Sonic at the start of Kingdom Valley, there's a brief cutscene between Shadow and Rouge in White Acropolis, and one between Omega and Mephilus in Wave Ocean. So much lost dialogue has been restored and inserted into the levels to round them out, and some of the levels take from other campaigns to make them fit better with the overall structure. I don't even need to convince you that 06 wasn't flawed from conception anymore, because P06 is living proof of my point. You get to enjoy the superb level design now, a perfect blend of the best 3D Sonic had to offer. I've played P06 more than I've played any new Sonic game in the last 10 years, and I cannot wait for it to be finished. But hey, if you believe Chaos X has taken way too many liberties with this fan remake, that he's added too many of his own flourishes, and that none of these features would have been implemented even if there was more time, you could also emulate 06 using Xenia, where you can apply a bunch of mods to restore what was lost from the base game. It's not as good as P06, but you can immediately see how the game jumps up in quality when you're actually able to play these levels without the game breaking in half. And if stuff like this can be fixed by one guy, Who's to say the story wouldn't have dramatically improved had there been a few more extra years? Another draft or two would have probably ironed out most of the plot holes and left us with a more coherent story. Maybe the load times would have been shorter. Maybe the visuals would have been better. Maybe the voice acting would have been more natural. Ah, <sighs> you get my point by now. I find myself in a tricky spot. Sonic no longer inspires much hope in me. I look at Frontiers and I don't see anything that interests me. An open world premise where it seems like you sort of just run around and grind on a few rails or homing attack some enemies, pick up random collectibles, and there are even some puzzles that I swear to Christ are ripped straight from Rise of Lyric. I'm not gonna say the game definitely had to have momentum or anything. You know who I am by now. Momentum sounds like a good idea to me, since it's been present since Sonic 1 and would fit the open world format like a glove, but it's not like it can't be good without it. I just haven't seen anything so far that would make it fun for me to run around the island. I think any potential hype or interest in this idea was killed the moment I saw Cyberspace for the first time. It's really tiring to see them use Green Hill and Chemical Plant again using level layouts copied from other boost games. It's really painful to have to say those words out loud. But apparently you aren't allowed to take issue with that because Mario and Kirby do it all the time. I really do not care how good the reasoning is for this stuff to be here. I was sick to death of these stages before Forces even came out. Now, I don't even know what to think. I don't know that they can ever do something entirely original again. It feels like they're afraid to rock the boat, especially after the financial ruin that was the Sonic Boom initiative. And with their recent ports being pretty awful, and their spin-offs being almost non-existent and pretty middling when they finally do release, I can't say I really have any faith in Sonic anymore. What hurts the most is the idea that it seems increasingly unlikely that I'm ever going to get to play as some of my favorite characters again. Sonic and the Black Knight was the last time I saw a Sonic I didn't want to punch in the face. These days he's an insufferable jerk who cannot and will not stop making awful jokes every time he's on screen. Tails has been relegated to Tech Boy, his development from SA1 and 2 is all but vanished, to the point where he cowers in fear at the sight of... Chaos Zero. Every other character is lucky to exist in any of these games, and when they do, they essentially just sit there and spew exposition. Playing Lost World and Forces used to really upset me, but nowadays, I kinda just feel numb to it all. But then, mob mentality being the way it is, I'd start to wonder if I'm the odd man out here. 
Complaining about Sonic on Twitter is met with harsh resistance, and most people seem to be loving what we've seen of Frontiers. I feel like I'm living in some alternate universe sometimes. I wasn't even this jaded during the Forces pre-release. I remember thinking that we were finally gonna try something cool again. Eggman has taken over the world and we have to take it back? We're finally gonna see all of these characters do something again? There was so much intrigue surrounding the rogues gallery. Why is Shadow working for Eggman? How did Chaos come back? And who is this mysterious infinite? We get to create our own characters too? That's awesome, and such a cool nod to the fan community. I was hooked. I was in. To add insult to injury, earlier that same year, fans released Sonic Mania. A wonderful game in my opinion. But you know what that sparked? Endless think pieces about how Mania is the future of Sonic and that all of his 3D outings are a mistake. It was miserable to be a fan of Sonic as a franchise after Forces came out. After all that, do you really blame me for looking at Frontiers with doubt? Yeah, Ian Flynn is writing the game. Cool. Except even on his own comic, we know that Sega held him back in various ways. Lord knows what kind of restrictions they have in place for a main game. I still don't really like the voice cast they're going with. They're banking on nostalgia for the tenth time. The music seems cool, but the music is always good. Maybe this franchise simply isn't for me anymore. Maybe everyone else wants something different. And to be honest, I've recently come to accept that Sonic is very likely not going to satisfy me anymore. When I went back to play all these games again, to make videos on them, from Sonic 1 to 06, it was really bittersweet. I rediscovered where my love for this franchise came from, where my love for these characters came from, where my love for this gameplay came from. I loved rolling around in Green Hill, plopping onto the tornado after defeating the Death Egg robot, chasing after the Master Emerald in space, watching Chaos finally find peace, watching Shadow sacrifice himself, running and jumping through Eggman's fleet, watching Shadow destroy the Black Comet, and banding together to save the universe from Solaris. Yet, as good as all that was, it was also a little painful. I knew where the franchise was headed after that, but those moments would become more and more sparse until they essentially vanished. But hey, those games I love, those moments I crave, they'll always exist, and they'll always be responsible for the games I love today. Nothing can change that, no matter how bad things get. I suppose what I want for the future of Sonic more than anything else is tolerance. We need to be okay with the fact that there are so many different opinions out there. Different people have different definitions of what makes Sonic good or bad. One person might love the momentum, one person might love the music, one person might love the characters, one person might love the level design, there might be a mixture of those. One person might prefer one era to another, and there's nothing we can do to change that, nor should we ever want to. None of those stances are more correct than the other. You know where I stand by now, and hopefully you can better understand why Sonic just isn't for me anymore. I love Sonic the Hedgehog. I hate Sonic the Hedgehog. But above all, I really wish he never died. Come on.